the Seahawkers podcast. I'm Brandon Schultz, and joining me this week from Seahawks Draft Blog, Mr. Rob Staten. Rob, how are you doing? I'm great, Brandon. It's it's a great time of the year to have the combine uh, just around the corner, and um, I'm looking forward to finding out a little bit about this draft and um, and seeing some of these guys work out and seeing who could be the next batch of Seahawks that we're going to be looking at in 2019. The NFL definitely has this timed out pretty well, because just when you get tired of talking about the Super Bowl and you've kind of worked out who's going to be on the watch list for, you know, potential uh, guys for franchise tags. You know, we know that with with Frank Clark and the Seahawks. And now it's to the point to where the free agency is not quite here yet, but we'll now have something to talk about just to get us to free agency in a couple of weeks. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, as soon as the Seahawks lost to Dallas, I was ready for the combine. You yeah. know, I, I kind of wanted the season to end right there because if the Seahawks aren't going to play anymore, it's it's quite difficult to kind of sit through the rest of the playoffs, watch a team win a Super Bowl, um, and then have this little bit of a gap to, to everybody kind of moving on, which we're kind of at now. You know, everyone's had their say on the Patriots and and beating the Rams, and we're now ready to sort of look ahead and look to the, to the proper offseason. So the combine... I know that they have the Senior Bowl before the Super Bowl, but then you have the Super Bowl hype as well. So this, for me, is kind of like the line where you draw, right, okay, 2018's in the rearview mirror. We're looking ahead to 2019. We're, we're looking at team building again. We're looking at teams giving themselves a chance to put themselves in contention for next year. And hopefully, with a good offseason, the Seahawks can take a step forward and can be one of those teams who who are contending at the end of next season. When you go into this draft, are you looking primarily at the defense because that's where the Seahawks have the need for the most improvement? Or are you waiting to see how free agency plays out before you really start to to go after where the Seahawks should focus on the most going into the draft? Okay, so I've done the the draft blog for 10 years now, and this is the most wide open offseason that I think I've ever written about and, and sort of discussed because I just think there are so many factors that could be in play here. Now, if if Russell Wilson signed a new contract next week and was tied to the Seahawks for the next four or five years, and if they had seven or eight draft picks already, let's say they got a few comp picks, and maybe they traded all Thomas rather than losing him to injury, then I would be saying, yes, it's the defense. You know, the, the, the defense and the pass rush in particular, and maybe creating a bit more depth in the defensive backs, and potentially having to replace KJ Wright would be the sort of the main priorities, that it would be a very defensive focused off season. I think that there are a lot of different things though which could change the dynamic of this. For example, we don't know what's going to happen with KJ Wright. We presume that Frank Clark's going to get the franchise tag. Free agency, a bit like the draft, is heavily stocked with defensive linemen. So I would expect that the likes of Jadavin Clowney, for example, Demarcus Lawrence, D Ford, Frank Clark are all going to get the franchise tag. But then there are maybe second tier players who are going to have their value impacted a little bit by the fact it's a fantastic defensive line draft. And that that could be an opportunity for the Seahawks to add some pass rushers even before the draft begins and try and find that value. Maybe do what they did in 2013 with Bennett and, and Averill and get a guy, you know, one of the, the players that I think could be a target in, in this kind of situation is someone like Anthony Barr, for example, at Minnesota. Mm-hmm. Um, could they bring somebody like that in? And if they do that and then they bring some pass rush in, if, for example, Michael Kendricks came back, assuming Kia Foyd's jail, um, then actually you sort of look at that and you think, well, the defense still maybe needs some extra depth and some competition in there. But is that going to be the priority? Because if you manage to address some of those situations before the draft even begins, then you look at the offense and you've got two guards who are free agents. You know, Sweezy and Fluker, I think, will be re-signed. But if they're not, then they become two key positions for you, really. Uh, I think you probably need to add there. There are question marks at receiver. For example, Doug Baldwin is a free agent the year after next. Uh, His cap hit for the next two years is $13 million. They've got Tyler Lockett tied up. But apart from that, They've only got two receivers signed to the roster at the moment, apart from those two guys, Mm -hmm. uh, which is David Moore and Jerome Brown. They've got four receivers signed up. They could do with another one. Um, So you're kind of looking at this. And then there's the quarterback situation because, you know, this is going to be the the major talking point for the Seahawks over the next few months. It it could be the big talking point for the next two years. You know, Russell Wilson can, can play on a franchise tag next year quite easily. And it's affordable. It's about $30 million. But if they franchise tag Russell Wilson, what are you going to do with Frank Clark as a free agent, Bobby Wagner as a uh, prospective free agent, and Jaron Reed as a prospective free agent? You know, are you going to lose those guys because you franchise Russell Wilson? Um, If you still don't come to an agreement once Wilson has been tagged, do you tag him again the following year? It's about $36 million. After that, it becomes too expensive. 
So do you have to sort of draft a quarterback at some point this year to act as a developmental guy that you can ensure yourself against the worst case scenario with Russell Wilson, which is you go year to year with him? Because if you go in year to year, you run the risk of losing the guy down the line, which, you know, I sincerely hope doesn't happen, but it's, it's something that we have to talk about. So I think that when you consider all those things, yeah, the, the main issue when you look at the 2018 team is get more pass rush. Can you add a linebacker? Can you get some more competition in depth to the defensive back positions? But actually the bigger picture for the Seahawks is you've got a lot of guys out of contract soon on both sides of the ball and you've got a lot of potential needs that could be addressed in free agency and by extending players, which could open up other needs for when the draft comes around. Well, that's one way that's it makes it so hard to to look at it too. Is that back when the the Seahawks were winning championships, going to Super Bowls, you seem to go into the draft thinking that they're looking two years ahead, two or three years ahead, rather than you know trying to fill needs right away. And now they're in a position where they, I, I don't know if they have that luxury really of of looking two to three years ahead like they did before, and and maybe they're doing that in in a way with drafting guys like Rashad Penny and you know Ethan Posick. So maybe they're they're still doing that to a certain extent, but with so many needs, it, it does make it so wide open. It does, and and I think that the other thing is that you just people assume that rookies are especially first round, second round rookies are impact players. And often they are, especially in the modern NFL. You know, you, it is possible to draft a rookie and then be very, very good straight off the bat. L- Russell Wilson's a pretty good example of that yeah. as a third round rookie in 2012. Um, but the Seahawks in particular, and a lot of other teams, let's not pretend that this is a Seahawks issue. A lot of their rookies have taken a few years to to get to their best. Golden Tate is probably the, the furthest back example of that. It took him a couple of years to really become an effective and dangerous player. Well, even um, Frank Clark, he, right? Uh, his first year. I was going to say, Frank yeah. Clark is, is another example. There, there are others, too, um, who took a little time. You know, Cam Chancellor had a redshirt year in 2010 before he became... And, and took some time to develop over 2011 before he became Cam Chancellor. So, well, I remember you know, even Cam Chancellor when he got signed to his... Big contract. Well, a lot of us looked at that and said, really? They're, they're giving Camp Chancellor this, this huge mega deal? Exactly. So it takes some time with guys. And Rashad Petty is a great example of that. Rasheem Green in, in the last draft as well had very little impact as a rookie. Rasheem Green and, and Penny was pretty limited across the year. Mm-hmm. So when, when you kind of look at this draft, you say, okay, if they just get, if they just draft a defensive lineman, for example, and if they just draft a linebacker, then okay, this team can take a giant step forward. There's every chance that the, the defensive lineman they take is going to be Rasheem Green, and he has a he has a red shirt year and has very little impact, and and same with the linebacker, you know, the, and and that's the thing you kind of have to remember with the draft, you're not always you have to be open minded about this and be prepared for the fact that whoever they take in the first two rounds is not necessarily going to come in and have this huge outstanding impact. It's possible, but it may not be, and and. Yeah, you know, looking down the line and building a team to be competitive for the long term. And this is why I talk about that. Listen, I do not buy into all of that. I have not bought into all of the stuff about, you know, them wanting to move on from Russell Wilson over the years. You know, it's been a topic on Seahawks Twitter for, for a few years. And, and John Schneider being spotted at all these quarterback pro days and looking at these guys. And why was he doing all of that? Is it because they want to move with Wilson? I think they fully, I think they love Russell Wilson. I think they probably think Russell Wilson's one of the best five players in the entire NFL. And I think they love nothing more and to come to an agreement on a long-term extension this offseason. But the problem is, is that I think Russell Wilson equally is quite content to do what Kirk Cousins did and go down the franchise tag route, which will guarantee him, you know, over $100 million over like a three-year span if he takes three franchise tags. And when you go year to year like that, from a franchise perspective, you have to consider what you're going to do. Because if he will not negotiate and come to some kind of agreement because he was willing to work on the franchise tag, you have to cover yourself. Even if you sign Wilson down the line to the extension while he's on the tag, you have to cover yourself. Because if you can't get a deal done, and you have to move him, and you have to trade him to get some kind of value before he hits free agency like Kirk Cousins did, you have to be prepared. You don't draft the rookie after you trade Russell Wilson, for example, or or even if he reaches free agency. You have to think two or three years ahead. So, the worst case scenario for drafting a quarterback with, let's say, within their first three picks this year, the worst case scenario is you just end up with a backup quarterback. The best case scenario is you've insured yourself for the future, which seems like a, a big win if it works out and, and not much of a, a loss if it doesn't. You know, People would say it's a wasted pick. I don't see it that way. I think it's securing yourself for the future. So that's one of the reasons why I talk about quarterbacks at the moment. 
on top of the fact that you know obviously defensive line linebacker receiver offensive line defensive backs are all prospective high pick needs as well one thing that worries me though about the idea of taking a quarterback either in the with the first round pick or the third round pick I don't know if the Seahawks are any good at picking quarterbacks like if, because from <laughs> all the, the history that we have, Russell Wilson is the only good one. They, I mean, they got Tavares Jackson and free agency. He was, he was fine, but you look at Charlie Whitehurst, you look at the, the, you know, Austin Davis, which in the news, he signed on as a offensive coach now for the team, Brett Hundley from the Packers, Paxton Lynch. I don't have a lot of confidence that they can draft. Well, at the quarterback spot. Yeah, I also heard a whisper in 2011. I, I, I don't know how true this is. It, it may not be true, but I had a little whisper that they they thought that Blaine Gabbert was the best quarterback in the 2011 draft, which Yikes. is the Cam Newton draft. <laughs> so, you know, it, but then they weren't the only ones. I mean, Blaine Gabbert went in the top 10. So, you know, the, the, a few teams felt that way. I, I think you make a very, I mean, the, the thing with the Charlie Whitehurst thing is they actually spent, I think, a third round pick on him and traded down from like an er, high top 10 of round two pick to the late second round because they traded with um, with San Diego Chargers. So they swapped second round picks and gave up a third to acquire Charlie Whitehurst, which was quite an investment at the time. Right. Um, well, so and, they, and that was a you big think move. In, in free agency too, when uh, that, that same year that they drafted Russell uh, to bring in Matt Flynn from the Packers and threw a bunch, exactly. a bunch of money at him too. <laughs> and he's not in the league anymore. So, and, and, but yet, offsetting all of this is one of the best quarterback picks of the, of the <laughs> right. last uh, of any of our lives. You know, to get Russell Wilson in the third round. You know, it's I think right there with with Tom Brady in the sixth round. This is probably the best value of a quarterback in recent memory. So it's it's very very strange that they have this huge hit in Wilson and and a, and a handful of misses as well. So I, I agree with you. I think that the what I would quickly say about the quarterbacks, because I, I don't think people want to hear us talk about quarterbacks too much, because you know Russell Wilson is still with the Seahawks at this point. And, and I don't, I don't even be. think that with the contract situation, I think they're going to get it figured out before the season starts. It just, I, so. I know that there's a lot of things to consider because Russell Wilson's, you know, business person. I'm sure he wants to make as much money as he can. But I also think that if the Seahawks put the right offer on the table that he'll sign it and he'll be under contract for the next two, three, four years. Maybe he doesn't go long term, you know, five years, six years like Matt Ryan. But uh, I do think it's when we start the season, when preseason hits, I think we'll see Russell Wilson under contract. Sincerely hope so. Really, really hope so. I think the the problem with with this particular draft, though, is I I suspect that if that happens, it probably will be the similar time frame to 2015 which was right before training camp and, and obviously the draft will happen a long time before oh, that sure. so yeah. <laughs> they, they may well still feel that in this particular draft we'll take a quarterback just to be just to be uh, sure on this um and then hopefully this will it may even act as a bit of leverage for the seahawks if they say look we're you know we're, we're willing to move on if we have to you know maybe that will be a small leverage point for them but i listen i i hope that wilson and and Fingers crossed that you're absolutely right with that, Brandon, and, and he will sign a, a long-term extension. I think you do have to prepare a little bit. I think that what I will say quickly on this quarterback class is that there are at least two guys that I've seen that I can imagine, yes, that the Seahawks may have some interest there. One of them is Kyler Murray, because clearly they're not interested in the whole height thing because they drafted Russell Wilson and, and made him one of the best quarterbacks. Kyler Murray, for me, is the, the best player of the draft. I just think he's fantastic. I think his ability to... He does everything. And I, and I think that the people who criticise him uh, clutching at straws a little bit because he, he just looks different. You know, he's a five foot nine franchise quarterback and, and they don't they don't have any of those to, to sort of compare him mm-hmm. to. And, and I think sometimes in the NFL, if you don't have somebody or in the, already in the league doing it, who then it's, it's tough to compare. But for me, he's a, I, I, it's shocking, but we've already got a player who's comparable to Patrick Mahomes coming into the draft and it's, it's Callum Murray. And he could be that kind of player. Um, and then, so for that reason, I think the Seahawks will like him. But I think the other guy that they will like is, is Will Greer potentially, from West Virginia because of his ability to throw downfield. Fantastic uh, downfield thrower, um, very accurate with his deep ball. Um, and and I think I, I watched a lot of his game. I've, I've watched all of his 2018 games now and some of his 2017 games and only watched them in the last month and became, became a lot more impressed than I thought it was going to be. And I think that because they value explosive plays in the passing game so much, I think he is somebody that they could look at. There are mechanical issues that he has, which sometimes take the, the edge off his arm strength and his velocity. I think that's something you can work on. So it's just something I think you kind of have to live with. If you run through all of the major quarterbacks in the NFL, all of them have some kind of mechanical flaw. I mean, look at the way that Philip Rivers throws the ball. But, you know, you can overrate those kind of things sometimes. Essentially, I think he looks a lot like the kind of player 
that this offence could use. And therefore, if he's there in round three and they think we want to add a quarterback just to provide some insurance there and someone that we can work with and develop just in case, and plus they need a cheap long-term backup quarterback and they've needed one for a while, then if it gets to round three and Will Greer's there, I think that is somebody that they may well consider. Well, you know, I'm even okay with them going quarterback in round three because... I mean, look at the guys that we've been shuffling through as backing up Russell Wilson these past three. You know, it's been at least three years since we've had a, a guy who could be steady. And I guess that that last guy was probably Trevon Boykin, uh, who was in there for a couple of years. And so there's really never been that guy where you can you have that steady presence behind him. And I think they could use that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I completely agree. And I, and I don't think there's anything wrong. I mean, when the Packers knew that Brett Favre was going to retire, and then obviously he didn't retire about three different times and then came back right. again. Um, but as they were sort of preparing to move on from, they drafted Aaron Rodgers. But then they also drafted Brian Brown in, in the second round. And they had, you know, Matt Flynn on the roster as well. They, they kind of said, we're going to move on from a legend. We need to give ourselves the best chance to sort of replace this guy. Uh, we're not just going to assume that Aaron Rodgers is the guy. And they brought in a lot of different guys. And in the end, they, they ended up with Aaron Rodgers. And I think it's a good plan to have. And I think sort of having that with the, with the Seahawks and, and with this question mark about Wilson's future and his, and his contract, at least while that remains, I think it would serve the Seahawks to, to perhaps consider taking a quarterback in this draft. Again, not with a top 10 pick or anything, but to, to consider drafting somebody that they like. And then next year, maybe doing the same thing. And just backing themselves up a little bit and saying, we're going to make sure that we're very, very planned and prepared for every eventuality over the next few years. Because who knows how this Wilson negotiation is going to go. Sincerely hope, as I've said about three times now, that he (laughs) stays and has a long-term extension. Because I don't want to be talking about quarterbacks the next few years with the Seahawks. And, you know, that was not much fun between, you know, 2010 and up to 2012 when Wilson was signed. But I do think they have to sort of just ensure themselves a little bit. And I think that's what they will do potentially in this draft or the next one. Well, I think the way to talk about it is just the advantage of look at the Patriots, how they've used those picks to their advantage over the past years with Garoppolo and with, uh, well, they drafted Ryan Mallet in round three, right? And they drafted Jimmy, Jimmy G in round two. Uh, Jacoby Brissett was a third round pick. So, and they traded him for Phil Dorsett. They traded Jimmy G for a second rounder. Ryan Mallett obviously didn't work out, but they've been able to turn those backup quarterbacks into value. Yeah, Matt and I'm Castle even thinking well. farther back, even the the guy that went to the, was it the Chiefs? Matt Castle, yeah. Matt was, Castle, right. Round pick. <laughs> they've, they've done this so well. They've drafted guys to put behind Brady, and they've gone in for one or two games and showed out, off enough that have interested other teams that they've been able to get value out of those, out of, out of those picks, ultimately. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. I, I, as I've talked about this quarterback situation, and uh, you know, uh, people have disagreed because one, people don't want to think about a life in, in Seattle without Russell Wilson, which I understand fully. I, I kind of, I'm with there. I'm with you on that one. If you have that kind of thought, but also they they kind of see it as a wasted pick. That wow, well, you know, that could be a, a starting linebacker, or that could be a, a, re- a great receiver, or somebody you know that could be the next Tyler Lockett or the next Frank Clark, or somebody that you're missing out on. But I think what you actually have to look at it as is an investment uh, in, in your future because we don't know what's happening with Wilson. And the worst case scenario will be you get a backup and you get somebody who could be trade value down the line. You know, one thing the Seahawks have not done very well in the Carroll era is trade players and get value back. You know, right. They've lost players or they've cut players or they've carried players into the point where they're not any good anymore and they've had to move on. They've not had a player who's kind of in the chamber, you know, who's got a bit of draft uh, trade value there. Um, let's go and move them and, and get some value back and let's, and let's churn the roster a little bit. And I hope that's something they're going to do in the future because I think it is important. I think it's one of the things that Patriots and other teams who have had success do well. You've, you've kind of got to be willing sometimes to, to do a bit of maneuvering. And that means moving some of your own guys. And if the Seahawks can get a backup quarterback who can you know, impress in preseason for a couple of years. If he ever has to, to come in in the game, then, then show what he can do, build, build a little bit of hype there, build a little bit of interest. At the very least, you've got a, a, an asset there that you could trade. The very least you've got is a backup quarterback who you, you can believe in, who's a, a cost-effective backup as well, is not going to break the bank. And you're not having to go year to year who the backup quarterback's going to be. Is it going to be Paxton Lynch? Is it going to be Brett Hundley again? Is it going to be another Austin Davis type? Is it going to be some veteran journeyman that they bring in? You know, answer that question by saying, we've got this guy for four years, great club control, great price. And if that's all you get out of it, then that's not a wasted pick. 
Well, let's talk about a position that they do need. And we can start on offense with offensive line. Again, we, we kind of laid it out with some of the questions that we have with the team. You know, do they, you know, Jermaine Effetti still, he's going into the final year of his deal at right tackle. You have, uh, fortunately, you have Jamarco Jones, who they picked last year, who they really like, who could, uh, who didn't have any kind of impact last year because he was injured. But then you have your two starting guards on either side, which are Sweezy and DJ Fluker. Going into free agency, it's kind of an interesting question of which one provides more value to the team because I look back at last year and I think J.R. Sweezy may have been the one who played better, but I also think of the value that that DJ Fluker provided by making... I, we saw improvement from Jermaine Effetti last year. Yeah, I think that both guys had a, had a real impact. I know that people have now looked through the, the, the stats, you know... Our good friends at PFF have, have decided to grade both players, I think, rather poorly. Um, yeah, you know, I, that's, that's interesting to me, too, because I do see this after the season going back and people saying, oh, man, the Seahawks offensive line, it really wasn't that good. But those yeah. of us who watched the games <laughs> all last year went, wow, this offensive line looks a lot better. So how how do we explain <laughs> that? How do we now go back and go, oh, based on all these numbers and statistics, our eyes must have been wrong? It's because of stats. It's because of <laughs> things like PFF who will, you know, watch these things and say, ah, do you know what? J.R. Sweezy's pass protection there wasn't particularly good. And, and then they'll, someone will mention the number of times that Russell Wilson gets sacked. They also won't mention that you know, quite a few of those sacks are when Russell Wilson holds onto the ball a little bit too long or tries to scramble and maybe gets dropped for a one-yard loss and it goes down as a sack. Or Russell Wilson tries to extend a play, which he's absolutely fantastic at. You would never want to take that away from him. But every now and again, a play, he tries to extend a little too much and he takes a sack as well. And that adds up to the tally. I mean, if, if, if he was a statue pocket passer in the Peyton Manning type mold and he was getting sacked as many times as Russell Wilson, it would be a, po- a problem. Russell Wilson is always going to be the mo- one of the most sacked quarterbacks in the NFL because of the way that he plays. So, yeah, I think that Sweezy and, and Fluka had a huge impact in the, in the locker room. Um, I had the opportunity to interview DJ, DJ Fluke at the London game and just his energy and his and his positivity is just incredible. He is a massive human being and I think I just love the idea of a huge right guard who you know wants to absolutely hammer people at the line of scrimmage. And I, I want to see both those guys back and I'm comfortable. If they only play 10, 12 games because they're going to get injuries, that's fine because Simmons played pretty well when he spotted in. Um, you know, they've still got Ethan Posey. They may well add another one in the draft or in, in free agency. So I'm pretty comfortable with the situation. And I don't think the offensive line, I thought for the first year in, in, in years, the offensive line actually was a, a kind of a strength because the running game really improved and was strong and they were physical and they were tough and they set the tone in a lot of games. It didn't happen every week, but certainly in some games it worked. It didn't work in the Dallas game. Maybe that's another reason why people are criticizing the O-line because that is their last memory of, the, of it, that it sure. played poorly in Dallas. Uh, but I think it's pretty good. That said, listen, I think this is a, a fairly decent uh, draft for offensive linemen in sort of the rounds two to four range. I think there's going to be some talent there. It's not a draft where you're going to see a lot of guys going in the first round um, who really excite you. But I think in rounds two to four, some very good guards, some very athletic offensive tackles. And we'll not be surprised at all if the Seahawks decide to tap into that and take an offensive lineman with perhaps one of their first three picks. So with the combine uh, coming up, what are some of the, the drills that, that you look for? I know in the past we've talked about TEF, the trench explosion formula, and that's something that you've kind of developed just based off of some of the clues that the Seahawks have given us over the years as to things that they look for in the draft. What are you going to be watching to try and at least have an idea of what players are going to be on the Seahawks radar? Well, obviously, the, the TEF formula um, was created with Tom Cable it, because Cable admitted what his sort of ideal physical profile was for an offensive lineman and enabled us to kind of create a formula which you could determine who was the best fit for that type of physical profile. And when we went back and had a look, um, it matched up with nearly all of the players that Seahawks had drafted on the offensive line over a you know set period of time since Cable took over. I've, I've no idea whether that is a formula that will stand true going forward now. I mean, I certainly don't think they're going to suddenly just draft the complete opposite and, you know, useless athletes uh, just because Tom Cable has gone. I still think explosive um, traits really do matter on the offensive line. And that showed up. Is it, it's not a Seahawks, it's just a Seahawks thing. It's, it's an NFL thing. You know, two of the best testers in terms of the explosive testing, which is the, um, the vertical jump, the broad jump, or the bench press. You know, two of the, the, the best testers, uh, were Colton Miller and Quentin Nelson, who were both top 20 picks, three of the second round picks in, in the O-line. Um, 
were also you know high scorers in the, amongst the top seven, I think, in, in this formula. So it, it still does matter. You know, explosive traits matter in both the defensive line and the offensive line. So I'm still going to be keeping an eye on that, seeing who the most explosive players are on offense and defense. Um, I also like to watch the, you know, the, the way that the, they do the mirror drill. If you're looking at an offensive tackle, to see a mirror drill, it's, it's a great way of seeing the footwork. You know, how athletic are these players? What is their stamina like? It, it's, it's a sneaky little drill for, for working out how um, a player's endurance, because basically what they're doing is just kind of standing in front of another offensive lineman and they're both kind of doing the little sidestep pass protection drill. Um, but the ones who can kind of finish it and aren't bending at the waist and using their knees a lot more and at the end of the drill don't look absolutely shattered and they're not laboring in the, in the final movements, they're guys that you think, yeah, do you know what? That, that's, that's pretty good. And it was watching Jermaine Effetti, for example, had a great drill in that. And it was one of the reasons why, on top of the, the explosive testing, where you thought he could be a genuine first round option for the Seahawks. And the other thing is the little kick slide drill that they do, which is just to see how good the kick slide is. Will Hernandez, a year ago, was a guard and did that drill as good as any of the offensive tackles. And it's one of the reasons why he was a high pick and really boosted his stock at the combine. So they're the kind of things that I'm looking for explosive traits, kick slide ability if you're a tackle. And how good do you do in the mirror drill? Those are, are basically the things to look for. Uh, I think because of the Seahawks and, and what we know from them from last year, I will also be looking for who are the guys with massive size. So if they don't re-sign DJ Fluker, who is who is the the guy who is that sort of three hundred and forty pound monster who could play right guard for them if they have to find another replacement? Or Jr. Sweezy, very explosive, lighter guard, but with a real nasty attitude. Who tests well in the explosive drills? Who's really athletic? And then when you go and watch them on tape, who's smashing people in the running game? Great run blocker. Got a bit of an edge to them who could potentially fill that JR Sweezy role. That's the kind of things I'm going to be looking for. Were you able to kind of estimate a spot of where Jones would fit in, Jamarco Jones, where he would fit into that formula? Because he didn't do the bench press last year, but you know he did the broad, he did vertical. Um, I know he didn't do very well in the 40-yard dash. I don't think that factors into the 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 TEP formula, though. But um, did you have you had any idea of where he might fit if he would have even been on the radar? He was not. He was not a good tester. He okay. was. He was not. And uh, I'm trying to. Remember, I, I seem to recall there was a a reason was given for this that he wasn't especially well uh, practiced for the for the combine. But there was a feeling that he could get up to a, a higher level, you know, and have a better combine, a better performance. If, if for example, there was a combine in first year into into his NFL career, there was a, that was sort of a sentiment there that he ha- there was potential there for him mm-hmm. to be more athletic than he showed at the combine. That I, I seem to recall that being a, a thing that was discussed at the time. But no, not not a particularly athletic player. I think when I watched him in in, in uh, for Ohio State, the the thing that stood out for him a year ago was that technically he was pretty good. And that's not what you often see from offensive tackles. You know, you often see a lot of bad habits. They often play these extreme spreads and Ohio State, one of the teams that used that with Irma Meyer. Um, so it was, it, it, he was surprisingly good there. So I think they probably looked at him and thought, here's a guy we can mold. We can work on his physical profile. We can get him into a, a proper nutrition program, get him into the gym, get him lifting weights, work on some of the agility tests there and some of that they can really harness and develop. And I think he's he's going to be like a new draft pick for them this year. He's going to be kind of a guy who comes in, competes, a tackle, and could be important with Jermaine Effetti and George Fant, both free agents at the end of, of the 2019 season. He's somebody that they may look at as someone who at the very least is a backup left tackle, but potentially a future starter at right tackle. Yeah, and Fant, a restricted free agent. So if they, depending on where they decide to tender him, uh, another team may come along and offer him a deal. The Seahawks decide not to match it, and and he could go along to another team like Gary Gilliam did uh, a couple yeah, of years may- back. Maybe a team will see him as a move tight end. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> it is interesting about Jones, though. I, you know, I was going back and looking at some of the mock drafts that were pre-Combine in 2018, and Jamarco Jones listed second third round uh, potential pick. And then it was because of such poor testing that he ended yeah. up sliding down to the fifth round of the Seahawks. And, and they love doing this. You know, they love these guys who drop a little bit in. I know that we've, we've spent a lot of time over the, the, the Carol era discussing how they love great athletes, which they do, you know, their first picks are nearly always difference making athletes and, and, and very traity, but they also love the guys that fall a little bit for one reason or another, whether that's uh, an injury um, Walter Thurman a good example there fell because of injury he was considered a second round type player but ended up in the fourth um, this guy that we're talking about here and, and then uh, you know one or two others the, the defensive tackle uh, from Alabama who fell Jesse Williams was another one Terrell Simon had a few issues there but he was considered quite a high 
uh, rated prospects back in the day fell a little bit because of character concerns and some other things. You know, they are willing to sort of take a chance on somebody later on. So that's also a thing to think about. If there are any players who are being graded, you know, first, second, third round, for whatever reason, fall a bit in this process, if they're there on day three, then just keep them in the back of your mind for when the Seahawks are picking because they have tended to sort of look at guys like that. You have to consider the fact that Dwayne Brown's kind of getting up there in age too. You know, if they're looking two, three years down the road, they might not be filling a tackle position for Jermaine Effetti. It could be to fill in behind Brown. Yeah, absolutely. It's something you have to consider. You know, I think that they would be willing to take, for example, a very athletic tackle at some point in this draft um, with the idea that they could compete to play at right tackle or guard, but could potentially a year or two down the line, take over at left tackle. I think, and because that is such an important position, we just look at the impact that Brown has had just to solidify that position in 2018. I think that they will will be mindful of that. And if they do get a chance to draft a really athletic, offensive tackle who could potentially play left tackle, I think it's something they will seriously consider doing. And when you look at this, this combine coming up, I think there are guys, you know, Chumura Dogra is a player, had a really good senior ball from a five-star recruit at USC has had a few sort of personality issues that people have, have raised. Um, I think the senior bowl is probably really right at his stock and he's a, he's a player that's getting some talk as a second, third round type player. Mm-hmm. And in that kind of range, I'd be, I'd be very happy, assuming everything goes well at the combine, to think that the Seahawks may well have a good look at him as somebody who could potentially play guard, right tackle, left tackle, had a great senior bowl. So they should think, consider Caleb McGarry at Washington, providing he goes through all the health checks of the combine. That's going to be important for him because of his heart, his previous heart issues. Big, strong, nasty, physical run blocker, tall, great height, decent length. The kind of player that you can imagine them going for. It could be a bit of a, Bre- uh, a Breno type at right tackle, but could, if, if he tests well at the combine, convince a few teams to maybe even try him at the left. You've got Andre Dillard at Washington State, but we're going to go a bit too early for the Seahawks. Uh, Yodney Kajust is a player who's expected to have a really good combine at West Virginia who played tackle. So there are guys that they may well look at and say that's worth a pick for the future, whether that's right or left tackle. Let's move on to running backs because, and I know a lot of people when they hear that, they're going to go, oh, they just drafted a first round running back. You know, they have Chris Carson, like the Seahawks are in good position for running back. But when you think they could be losing Mike Davis this off season. Uh, you don't know really what the status is with JD McKissick, CJ Procise. The other side of that token, Rob, is that um, it's it's usually very clear who's going to be on their list come draft time. Yeah, it's 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 probably the most we've got the most clarity at running back compared to all of the other positions because nearly every player that they've drafted uh, under Carroll has been the same physical type of player. You know, they just have set parameters they have a type at running back and that is you know around 510 511 six foot in height it's about 220 pounds give or take a, you know a few pounds there they have a very good test in the broad jump you know we're talking like 35 inches and above um sorry in the vertical and then in the broad definitely more than 10 um 10 0 in the broad 10 foot um anything above that you know that's that's kind of the 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 kind of profile they've looked at and because we established that, you know, because everybody from 2010 to, to sort of 2015 fit into exactly the same profile from Spencer Ware to Robert Turbin to Kristen Michael, um, some of the others that they've taken, you know, even Marshawn Lynch fit into this who they traded for. Because of that, we, I've, I started, I've done it for the last three drafts now, saying, right, who are the players who fit this ideal profile? And in 2016, there were only two players who fit into this profile. One of them was Kenneth Dixon, who ended up in Baltimore, and one of them was CJ Procise. So we were able to say in 2016, I think if they're going to draft a running back, it'll probably be one of these two players. They drafted Procise. It was that simple. In 2017, there were four players, only four players, who fit into the parameters of their type of running back. Those were Joe Williams, who was drafted by the 49ers, Alvin Kamara, you know, you'll know him from his, from his Saints, yeah. uh, two-year career at the New Orleans Saints, and has become one of the best running backs in the league. Brian Hill, um, who was at Wyoming, and then Chris Carson, who they drafted and has become the starter in, in Seattle. So again, only four names from a whole class of running backs. You know, there's like 20 to 25 running backs there. Only f- two names in 2016 and four in 2017. Mm-hmm. And we hit, and we were able to find two players from those groups that they actually drafted. And then 2018, which was the year of the, the running back, a longer list. You know, I think there was eight players that we identified that they could have potentially taken. Saquon Barker was not going to be there. But then Kerry on Johnson, Bo Scarborough, Nick Chubb, John Kelly, LeVon Coleman, Royce Freeman, and Richard Penny. 
Obviously, they drafted Rashad Penny in the first round. They also had Levon Coleman on the practice squad for a, a period of time. And they signed Bo Scarborough to the active roster. He's still on the active roster, I believe, at the moment. Yeah. Um, he's still with the Seahawks. So, of that list of, of eight from 2018, one they're never going to have a chance to get, which was Saquon Barkley. Of the other seven, they actually ended up with three of them, which was, <laughs> you know, it, again, it kind of shows they have a type. We, we're able to identify the running backs. It's not a big mystery who they're going to take at running back this year. So, again, you know, you, you mentioned, are they going to take a running back? Obviously, I don't think they're going to spend their, their first pick on a running back this year. But with with a question mark over Mike Davis and a question mark over CJ Procise, and because they want to run the game and, and run the ball and, and feature the running game, there is at least some point that they may well consider taking one. And when they had Marshawn Lynch in his, in his best and his peak, they still drafted Robert Turbin in 2012 with a fourth round pick. And they still drafted Kristen Michael with their first pick in 2013 in second round. So I think that there could be, whether it's the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh round in that kind of whatever that range, I think there's a chance that they will add a running back at some point. They, they will certainly consider it. Um, we will find out uh, this week who those players are who could fit into that. The running backs work out on, uh, on Friday and we'll create the list again and we'll ident- see how many names crop up this year. There are certainly some players in this class that I'm going to be keeping an eye on that I'm pretty in- excited to see. Uh, Rodney Anderson, for example. You know, we were talking about players, just to, to go back to what I was saying a minute ago, mm-hmm. who could fall to round four or five because of a reason, but has got the talent that the Seahawks could, could consider. Rodney Anderson's had a lot of injuries in his career and had a very serious knee injury at Oklahoma in 2018. Um, if he had not had that knee injury, there was a very good chance he'd be a top 25 pick. He's big, he's physical, he finishes runs, he's got electric speed, he's, he's tough, he's highly explosive, had a great spark test when he was in high school. He's exactly the type of player that the, the Seahawks like at running back. And if he lasts into the fourth or fifth round because of this knee injury that he sustained at the start of 2018, I wouldn't be surprised if the Seahawks took a chance at him because he's a major, major talent. He's one player to look at. Damian Harris' stock really dropped off this year because he wasn't the guy at Alabama. He was sharing a lot of the load with Josh Jacobs. Damian Harris does everything well. Very explosive. Ideal Seahawks size. Great pass protector. Will be the best pass protector in this draft class by an absolute mile. You've got other guys like Mike Weber at Ohio State. And a guy that I really like, a temple called Reichwell Armstead, who had a decent senior ball, tough, physical, let's see how big he is. But, you know, there are names that they may well consider adding, not with their first pick this year, but later on, because they are a run-centric team. We talked about CJ Procise. What do you think about a guy like Tony Pollard for Memphis, who played wide receiver, played running back, you know, six foot two ten. So he's kind of in that range of, a, uh, of the running back size mold that they look for. What about him? I like him. I like both of the guys at Memphis who are in this draft class. Um, I mean, obviously, we need to see the kind of, you know, the, the numbers that I've seen for him is that he's about six foot and about 208, which is perhaps not quite the kind of size that they've looked for there. But we'll find out when he weighs in at the combine early this week. He's going to be one of the first to weigh in uh, with the running backs there on the first day of the weigh in. So uh, we'll find out pretty soon. Um, I think if they end up, you see, here's the, here's the thing because Rashad Penny was, was considered a really good pass catcher. And Chris Carson was, is also very good in the passing game. So if they want to feature a running back in that kind of passing game, I'd kind of rather than see them establish it a bit more with Carson and with Penny than necessarily go down the route again of trying to find someone like CJ Procise who can do a bit of that ex-receiver type who has got that. I mean, that's a nice player to have. Um, but I, I kind of just wonder whether or not just just to feature more the guys that you've invested in, which is Carson and which is Penny, because they're both very capable in the passing game. And just if you want to get another running back, I'd rather see the third wheel be like a Mike Davis type, who if you need him to start and grind out those hard yards, which they needed from Davis in a number of serious games, you know, the, the Rams games, for example, the Arizona game on the road, he did a great job for the Seahawks. And I think you've got that sort of bigger bodied, explosive. I really like Mike Davis. I hope they, I hope they keep bring him back and, mm-hmm. and sign him. Because I just think he's a really useful guy to have. And I like, plays with a chip on his shoulder. And if, if, he, if he's playing a game because Carson and Penny's hurt, I'm not worried at all about him coming in and playing. So I hope they bring him back. If not, I hope they go and get a similar guy to that. The next position I want to talk about, tight end. And this is a spot that you wouldn't necessarily think of it as a position of need because they signed Ed Dixon last offseason. They drafted Will Disley. They have Nick Vanette. But at the same time, you have that question of, well, is Disley going to be the same type of guy coming back from his injury? Is Dixon going to be a cap casualty? You know, that might be a position of need going into this draft. I think it is, it is a, the kind of position, and to go back to what we were talking about at the start, that could be a position of consideration early in the draft 
if that's where the value is and if they address some of the needs in free agency. And it's because Ed Dixon is a veteran. He's a stopgap and he's had injury issues throughout his career and had them at the start of last season as well and missed the first, what, six, seven games. Um, and then you look at Nick Vedette as a free agent after this season and you look at Will Disney coming back from a serious knee injury and you look at the fact that, again, they're a running team. They know what they want to do. And the tight end position is pretty important to what they want to do. So I do think it's something they could look at. And it is a, a tight end draft with some options there. Now, TJ Hawkinson, I'm, I remember mocking him to the Seahawks with their first pick a few weeks ago. Since then, his stock has just exploded. And like everybody's talking about him now as a, a potential top 10 pick. The, I've watched all of his games from 2018 now, and I absolutely see it. You know, I think he's going to go 8, 9, 10. I think the worst case scenario for him is probably Cincinnati at 11. He's that good. He's, mm. he's very, really, really good. I think he's going to have a fantastic combine. I think he's going to destroy it. And I think he's going to be a top 15 absolute lock. But apart from that, there are other guys. And, and there's kind of a bit of everything from this tight end group. You've kind of got those joker tight ends and, and move tight ends. You know, you've, you've got the highly athletic guys. You know, Mike Jasicki last year had a great workout. I think Noah Fant's going to be that guy from Iowa this year. You've got the blockers. You've got your Drew Samples. You've got your, your Trayvon West goes at West Virginia. Caden Smith at, at Stanford, I think, is a player who could come in and be a Zach Ertz type. And, and it's not, I'm not just making that connection because they're both Stanford. It, you know, that's the type of player he is. He's not, a, he's not an amazing athlete, but he gets the job done. You know, he can run every route, make every type of catch, downfield, cross the seam, shorter uh, routes, he can do a bit of blocking. I think he's kind of a, a, a really decent all-round type tight end. So I think there's, there are options there for any team that wants to take a tight end, um, probably through the first four rounds. And I think the, there are possibilities where the Seahawks look at this and think, yeah, you know, that's a good range to get someone. I, I think that they, I genuinely think that they will look at Wesco and Sample at Washington and think these are these are guys sort of built in the mold of a Will Disley type. And if you can get another guy like that, especially with Vanette being a year away from free agency, I think that you you have to seriously consider it. So for the combine, it looks like. The short shuttle is the time to watch because the Seahawks really like tight ends with a sub four five short shuttle. Yeah, that's what the the data has shown. I actually had a look a few weeks ago um, in preparation for, for doing this piece, and you know there was there was a real connection there. So Lou Wilson, for example, ran a four two nine at his pro day in the short shuttle. Will Disley didn't have a great combine. Now Will Disley did not. Um, he wasn't Jimmy Graham or anything at his combine, but he actually ran the eighth best short shuttle amongst the tight ends in 2018, which was a 4-4 out, which is pretty good for his size. It was a lot bigger than Luke Wilson. So that was a really good short shuttle. Nick Vanette, really good short shuttle, the second best short shuttle amongst tight ends in 2016 with a 4-2-0. Um, Zach Miller was a 4-4-2. They signed him free agency, so similar to Will Disley. Jimmy Graham, a 4-4-5. Um, Anthony McCoy was a 4-5-7. Again, another sort of bigger tight end, not a bad time for him. So it, it certainly looks like that is a test that we should be looking at for the tight ends. I, I can remember there was a lot of talk. I think Davis Sue um, was saying on Twitter a lot that they like OJ Howard, that they thought that OJ Howard was the best player in the 2017 draft. It was mm-hmm. one of the, the top rated players in the, uh, in the 2017 draft on their board. He ran a, a 4-1-6 short shuttle, which is absolutely crazy for his size. Um, it's, it's, you know, the top defensive backs kind of run that kind of time. And he was like 250 pounds. Also a great blocker, also a decent pass catcher. So, you know, I, I do think that when you're looking at the tight ends of the combine, the things that I would look for are really the short shuttle and the 40 and the 10 yard split. You know, how agile are these guys? Three cone as well is important. How good are they changing direction? Do they catch the ball well? You know, catching techniques important. They present their hands to the ball in order to make their catches when they're doing the passing drills. You're not going to learn much in the blocking just because they're just be blocking against pads. It's not really a serious, not like the senior ball. We actually get to see him go one v one. So you're not going to learn much from that. So yeah, I'd say the forty ten yard split, short shuttle three cone, and pass catching technique are the, th- are the things to look for. Well, with that said, let's move on to wide receivers. Now, last time we chatted, Rob, we talked about DK Metcalf as a potential option at C- for the Seahawks. I saw in a mock draft with him going toward the last part of the first round that he could be the guy that the Seahawks ultimately go for in the first round. I think I've said this to you before, Brandon. Personally, I, I kind of feel like it's the easiest position to, to, to scout for for the NFL. Mm. I'm not sure what other people feel about that who, who kind of geek out on these videos like I do during the college season, but I, I think 
it's it's usually pretty easy to see who separates and gets open. It's you know all you have to do is kind of look at it, <laughs> how a guy releases and whether when he breaks off his route and 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 this makes his move. Is there some separation there? Is he providing a window for a throw? And because in college football the defensive banks are not as good as the NFL, it's pretty easy to see. And you know when you watch whether it's a smaller receiver, whether it's someone like Odell Beckham. You could just see that Odell Beckham could separate. You know, it was it was clear that he was a very very good player. You could see that Mike Evans, who was a much bigger receiver, could get open, could get downfield, could separate on the shorter routes, and got that sort of quickness and suddenness. You could see it in Percy Harvin. You know, you could it's it's just stands out who the really good receivers are um, in college football, and it also is blindingly obvious when players can't separate. So. You know, I've I've been asked so many times over the last few months about people like Nkeel Harry at Arizona State, Hakeem Butler at Iowa State, and and players like this. And you know what? They they win a lot of contested catches. They make a lot of explosive plays. They make great catches. You know, very difficult cast catches. But it's always under pressure. It's always taking the ball away from a defensive back. It's very rarely because they've managed to separate on a release. And and that is an issue at the next level because the defensive backs are even better. They're going to not win as many contested catches and they're going to look pretty average. And, you know, you think back to a guy like Jalen Strong a few years ago, had all of the hype, big name, decent stats at Arizona State, even ran a 4-4-40, has not had much of a, an NFL career because he couldn't separate. And if you're going to draft anybody, they have to be able to separate. And, and when you're sort of watch, watching this draft uh, class and you're watching the combine, You've got to pay attention to the 10-yard splits. You've got to pay attention to the 40-yard to the dash. You've got to pay attention to the short shuttle and the three-coat. You've got to pay attention to how they run downfield. Are they natural catching it over the shoulder? Again, the catching technique, they're cupping their hands to the ball, not fighting it, no alligator arms. These are the kind of things to look for. And when I look at this draft class, um, the one other thing that I think that people have got to be remember here is that the Seahawks have got a type of receiver as well. They have never drafted a receiver who has run um, a four... Sorry, let me, let me correct myself on this. They've only drafted two receivers who've run slower than a 4-4. And that was Kenny Lawler, who ran a 4-6-4, drafted him in the seventh round with a seventh round flyer. Mm-hmm. And Chris Harper, who ran a 4-5-0. So it was as close to a 4-4 as you can get. Everybody else, big receiver or small receiver, has run a 4 four forty. So that's Paul Richardson, Golden Tate, Tyler Lockett, Chris Durham, Kevin Norwood. Mara Darbo, David Moore, they all crack the four fours. So whether we're talking about someone like DK Metcalf, who's enormous, he's got like a, a WWE type frame at the moment, he's probably spent a bit too much time in the gym, or whether it's Marquis Hollywood Brown or AJ Brown or who anybody else, if they're not running a four four, the Seahawks probably aren't drafting them early. Cross them off the list. Pretty much. I mean that's and that's it. You know, they they want speed. Even if they're a big guy, they still want speed. So all of these bigger guys, you know, you're in Keel Harry's, you're Hakeem Butler's and people like this. If they're running the four fives, running into the four sixes, the Seahawks probably aren't going to draft them. That's just what history tells us. Well, I hope they avoid the fourth round because I look at that list of guys uh, with with Harper and Durham and Darbo and uh, they, they seem to do better going early with Paul Richardson, Golden Tate, Tyler Lockett. I guess Darbo was round three with Lockett, too. But that, just those middle rounds, they for whatever reason, they seem to struggle with those types of receivers. Yeah, and it's a good receiver. It's a decent receiver class. There's not the sort of the top first round guys that you know you, you expect to go in the top 10. There's no Odell Beckham's, Mike Evans types, and, and Sammy Watkins in this, in this draft. But there is going to be, from again, from rounds two to four, if they trade down into, two, into round two, acquire some picks in rounds three or four, there's going to be some options for the Seahawks there. You know, just to run through some names that people might want to keep an eye out for. Terry McLaurin, Paris Campbell at Ohio State are both going to have fantastic combines. They are really good players. Paris Campbell's kind of like a bigger Percy Harvin. He's got a converted running back, much sturdier, no character issues there. He's going to run an explosive 40 times. He's going to do everything well. His catching technique's really good. Terry McLaurin was one of the stars at the Senior Bowl. Absolutely loved Terry McLaurin. Has boosted his stock way up into the second round, possibly even a late first round pick. Oakland seems to love him at the Senior Bowl. Uh, Emmanuel Hall is a burner at, at Missouri, someone to keep an eye on there. DK Metcalf, who we've talked about as a possible option for the Seahawks because of his size. cal has been looking for this huge, incredibly dynamic, athletic, big receiver for a long time. He may fall because of a neck injury and because of the, the great size. But if he runs a 4-4, four, four, 
then if people are okay with the, the, the neck injury, he's going to go in round one, or he could be an option for the Seahawks in early round two. And one of the other players I'm really interested to see is J.J. Arcega-Whiteside, because I, I had so much fun watching him. I mean, he's a, he's a, he wins a, a ton of contested catches. I've not seen a player box out a defender like he I've never seen a receiver box out as well as he does. Hmm. He gains position and catches so many touchdowns and so many key third down passes because he just boxes out, gains position, and wins and wins and wins. But unfortunately, um, separation is an issue there. He doesn't separate that much. And if he isn't running in the four fours, then the Seahawks probably aren't even going to consider him. It's uh, one of the final points I'd say on the receivers. It's a bit of a shame, but we're not going to see Marquis Brown test. He's got a list Frank injury, so he's not going to be running or anything like that. He probably would have had a fantastic combine. And Preston Williams um, is one of the three players that you may have seen this report that was um, initially barred from the combine along with Jeffrey Simmons and Jalen Ferguson there because of off the field incidents. I'm not sure why they haven't gone through the entire class because a lot of players have done worse things than, for example, Jalen Ferguson have and have still regained their invite and are still going to participate. Um, they've since gone back on that and have decided to, to allow the three players to actually attend the combine for interviews and medicals, which is a wise decision. Not sure why they're not working out as well. Preston Williams might be the best receiver in this draft class at Colorado State. Um, uh, transferred from Tennessee, Former five five star guy had all the big scores looking after him. Has got major red flags in terms of character and off the field and stuff that he's done. Um, unlike Jeffrey Simmons, has not sort of had that uh, redemption period of three years where he's, he's kind of turned his his image around and, and regained some of his stock. Um, a lot of people think that he could be an undrafted player simply because of the off the field issues. Yet yeah, watching Preston Williams on tape was a real treat. I mean, he he just looks a little bit like. He's got a bit of a T.O. thing going on in, in terms of his play on the field. A um, little bit of Des Bryant in him, I would say. I just think he just looks fantastic. And I, I, I don't know whether the Seahawks will have him on their board or not, but just a real fun player to watch. And it's a shame he's not going to be able to work out at the Combine. Well, for the guys who are working out at the Combine, you, you mentioned with the tight ends, you know, presenting your hands to the ball when they're doing those catching drills. What, what does that look like exactly for, for people who you know, may not be as, as seasoned at watching tape as you, Rob. So what you want to be looking for is, I'm, I'm going to try and describe this. Obviously, it'd be great if you had a visual for this, but it, 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 the, the players who kind of have their thumbs touching, so their two thumbs touching and their hands cupped, and then they're stretching out their arms and bringing the ball in. So they're actually presenting their hands to the football, and then as the football, and so their arms are, are away from their body, and then as the, the ball reaches their, their palms, they're bringing it into them. So they're plucking the ball out of the air and bringing it into their frame. Why is this important? Because if you're ever competing for things in the red zone, if you, you know, usually in the NFL, you're going to have a defensive back draped on you, you know, or gonna, even if you create initial separation, they will recover. They've got that recovery speed. And if you are taking the ball away from your frame and bringing it into you, it gives yourself a better chance to get control of the football gather it in and if a, even if a defender is batting it in there and trying to get a hand in there it will not be disrupted if your hands are apart sort of that alligator arms thing so your thumbs are not connected if your arms are separated and you're trying to essentially clap the ball you know you're trying to it's like a clapping motion that you are trying to grab the ball in the air then the chances the ball will shoot through if you misread it there's a better chance of a defender getting in there. If you control the ball, it's harder to get control of it if you're clasping your hands together. So even though you might bring it in initially, it, it also could bobble out and you could you know, double catch it maybe in, uh, along the sideline or again in the red zone. That can be an issue if you've, you've got a very really minimal space to work for. You could drop the ball as you go to the ground because you've not got a full control. You know, It's just that the catching technique is quite something. You want to be plucking it to your body, bringing it in, and you will see very clearly, it's one of the easiest things to, to scout um, when you're watching the combine is to watch how the players actually catch the ball. So when you're seeing them going through all of these drills, you're seeing the, receive, the quarterbacks throwing it all over the field to them. They're running all of these routes. The two things to look for is, are they presenting their hands of ball, catching it? Is the catching technique good? And also when the ball is in the air on those deeper routes, are they going up and getting it and high pointing the football or they're letting it coming into their body and body catching it. You want to see them high pointing the football. Guys like Tyler Lockett were fantastic at the, with their catching technique and the way they high pointed. Not a surprise that the Seahawks loved them. I think the Seahawks do pay attention to this sort of catching technique. And I think that it is going to be something that people want to really keep a close eye on when they're watching the receivers and the tight ends. All right, Rob. Well, I got a, a question in from one of our listeners 
from Santiago Lopez. So before we go to defense, let's talk special teams. And Santiago says, is there any kicker worth drafting? We struck gold with Dixon last season and the draft could be a way to solve our problems at kicker or could we trade CJ Procise for Hashka? The Bills don't know what they're doing anyways. Go Hawks. <laughs> you know what? I, I'm going to have to say no. Um, I, I, there isn't anybody that I've seen that I sort of feel confident projecting as someone that they would look at. Um, I think it's a possibility because they obviously do need to find a cost-effective solution here. And, um, you know, my kind of hope in this offseason was they were going to go out and sign a really cool free agent kicker. Bobby Gold was the guy that I wanted them to have. He, the Niners are already talking about franchising him. He's already sort of flirting with the idea of going back to Chicago where he's much loved. And I suspect that would be a move that would really appeal to him. So I'm, I'm not holding out too much hope there. Um, so I, I'm a little concerned by it. I, you know, I, I, they need to find a solution somewhere. Is, is, there a, is there a Dixon out there who's a kicker instead of a punter? I don't think there is. I can give a name, uh, a couple of names. Matt Gay is a player at Utah who is probably about as good from this class as, as you can get. And there's a guy called uh, Cole Tracy at LSU who was a bit hit and miss. You know, they're players that you could potentially look at. I think Austin Siebert at Oklahoma set some records, um, but there isn't anybody who I would sort of say, that's the guy, go and get them. They're going to solve this issue in the way that Dixon solved the, the, the punting issue long term. So I do think that probably going to have to go the free agent route again and maybe have a kicking competition in this off season and um, or rather in preseason and see who can win out. And I think they're going to this is a, this is probably going to be another issue that unless they can get a Goskowski or a Gold, they're going to be pushing further down the line and hoping for the best. I don't even like the idea of Austin Siebert because I don't want a guy trying to you know move in on Dixon's territory. Because I mean, a guy who can kick, I, I don't know why there's not more guys who can both kick field goals and punt, though. That seems like a skill that should be d- transferable. Yeah, I thought you were going to say that Austin Seabert was kind of stamping on the Seabass nickname a <laughs> no. little bit there with it. the Seabert um, from the Seabass to the Seabert. Maybe that's why it's, maybe they'll draft him. And that's the destiny. Yeah, maybe that's the guy then. I do like I, I like guys with nicknames, though. I mean, we had we had Seabass. We had House Money. You know, uh, Cobra Kai uh, is out there. Uh, Kai Forbath as a free agent. You know, that that that's appealing to me. Yeah, I, I, I think especially with Hauschka, um, any, any way that you could kind of shorten his name so you didn't have to write it out in full as well was because he, he had one of those fiddly names that if, as a blogger um, or as a writer that if you try and you write it over and over, you always have to Google exactly how to spell it. <laughs> Um, and that is, it, trust me, over the course of a, a few seasons, that becomes tiresome. You never quite learn how to properly spell his name. You, you end up Googling it all the time. So uh, any kind of nickname in that situation is beneficial. But uh, I'm sorry, I, I wish I had a better answer on this. Um, I, I haven't actually spent that much time scouting kickers. It's, it's quite a difficult thing to do because, <laughs> you know, the, as much as I am grateful to the people who cut these videos up of, of players and put them on YouTube, there aren't many that do it for kickers. No. <laughs> so um, unless you've actually got game tape, and, you know, I do save a lot of games on my TV system and go back and watch them on there because they're not on YouTube. Um, but unless you've actually got, you know, full games of Utah and you can actually go through and fast forward to when the kicking game is involved to, to watch specifically Matt Gate, it's one of the harder positions to actually scout from an amateur scouting point of view and, and, a, and a draft blogger point of view. So I wish I had more answers for you there. Um, those are three names that, uh, I would sort of suggest as, as, as people to keep an eye on as potentials. And if you want to go and do a bit of, of research, then go and look up them. Um, but there isn't a, a Dixon out there that you think, yeah, you know, this guy's Michael Dixon. He's, he's going to solve this issue and he's going to be great for, for Seattle as a rookie, I'm afraid. Let's move on to the defense and starting with defensive line. You know, definitely could be a place that the, the Seahawks go in the draft this year. Now, is there any kind of, uh, trench explosion formula TEF for guys on the defensive line, or are we more relying on different types of drills to, to where the Seahawks could go with their players on the line? Well, uh, what I've actually done over the last few years is, is just use the same formula for the defensive linemen and not mm. because it's any kind of indicator of, Hey, this guy is, uh, you know, can be drafted by the Seahawks or is even a, a good defensive lineman, but it's just the great thing about the formula is it does just help you compare players. So you can compare how explosive all of the offensive linemen are just by using the formula. You can compare how all how explosive all the defensive linemen are, again, by using the formula. So you can find out who are the most explosive players in both units 
um, just by using it. So it, it has become quite beneficial and it's enabled us to see. And, and, and look, you know, your Aaron Donalds and your JJ Watts and, and all of these players that have dominated the, the league have all tested fantastically in TEF. So it, it does it is an indicator of just how great the very best are. So yeah, it's it is a way of measuring things, and I'm convinced. Look, I, I don't. Even, I think it's an, an absolute certainty that teams have their own formulas like this that are probably a lot more detailed than the one that we use to determine and separate certain players and, and help them with their gradings. It's just a simple thing. That explosive traits matter so much. Yeah, when you consider what you need, play in, play out to to generate that kind of power. To you know whether or not you're rushing the um, pass rusher going after the quarterback or a guard trying to blow a defensive lineman off the ball in the running game, like those, all those tests are able to to measure the the type of power that uh, one of those players' legs can generate for them. Yeah, and, and in the trenches, it is so important. You know, these guys are just crashing into each other and trying to gain leverage and trying to to push the other one back. It's it's a wrestle. You know, it's it's a battle in there. And people love to use the, the cliche, the rhetoric of games are won in the trenches. Well, if that's the case, then the more powerful, explosive players are going to win more often than not. And you do see the more explosive offensive linemen uh, do go early. Colton Miller, a great example of that. Quentin Nelson, a great example of that. How often do you see a guard drafted in the top 10? Not very often. Mm. Quentin Nelson was a highly explosive offensive lineman who had a great career at Notre Dame. He was destined to go early because of that. Um, so it is very, very important. And defensive linemen for the last few years have absolutely destroyed the offensive line classes in terms of sheer numbers of explosive athletes, in terms of how they test. They, they all test better than the offensive linemen in general as well. I don't think that's going to be any different this year. This is The defensive line is, the, without a shadow of a doubt, the, the standout group from this draft class. We could see as many as 10, and 12, 10 or 12 going in the first round. We're going to see depth right through to rounds two, three, and four. I think the Seahawks are almost certainly going to add a pass rusher in the first three picks. It's, it's, it's a no-brainer. They're going to do it. It's just whether or not, if they trade down into the 30s or 40s, is there still going to be a defensive lineman left that they like enough to take in that spot? Or are they going to wait until rounds two and three or whatever or four to, to get their guy and, and bring somebody in? I will say, though, that, there probably will be a really cool player for them in rounds two, three, or four if that's what they choose to do. So it's not absolutely desperate that they take a defensive lineman with their first pick or a pass rusher, but it's it's very possible if they don't. There are so many good players in this class, Brandon, that it's it, it's just going to be a joy to watch when they work out. And I'm convinced that people are going to have a lot of fun looking at this class when they actually do their workouts because it is going to be it's going to be the the big day, the big the big sort of groupings from the combine this year is this defensive line class because without any doubt whatsoever, the best unit. Well, in your latest blog, you talk about the 10 yard splits, the, the 10 yard splits definitely seem to be one of the factors that the, the Seahawks look for. You bring up Bruce Irvin and, and Cliff Averill and their 1.55, 1.5 splits. And that anything in that kind of range is considered elite for an edge rusher. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So anything in, in a one fives, the NFL network is very helpful with this. They will post the 10 yard splits as the players are running their 40-yard dashes. So you will see that on the screen and you will be able to sort of make a note of, of the players who run in the one fives who are defensive ends. Any defensive tackles running the one fives, then put them at the number one overall pick because that's incredible. But it's sort of the edge rushes we're looking for here. Anything in the one fives for those 250 to 270 pound defensive ends is considered elite. Cliff Averill, Bruce Aver- Irvin, as you mentioned, had fantastic times in the 10-yard split. That's what people need to be looking for from the edge rushers, from the more defensive tackle pass rushers or you know the inside-out type of guys, your you, you, you players who kick inside on, on passing downs to rush the pass, or your Rasheem Green types. You can you can go into the one sixes. So if, if I think Rasheem Green ran a one six five ten yard split. Hmm. Frank Clark ran in the one sixes. You know that that's the kind of range that you're looking at for those bigger players who are kind of two eighty two ninety pounds maybe. Um, so that's that's something that certainly seems to matter to the Seahawks. The other thing that seems to matter for them, especially on the interior rushers, um, is the short shuttle. Now every single guy that they they've taken who's kind of an inside out guy or uh, a defensive tackler has had a great short shuttle. So Rasheem Green, a 4.39, superb. Quinton Jefferson, a 4.37, even better at his size. Fantastic time. No surprise at all that they traded up to get him and were quite aggressive to get him given that time. 
Jordan Hill, a 4-5-1. People wondered, you know, what's spectacular about Jordan Hill? Long arms, great shorts, so take him in round three. Um, Jay Howard, a 4-4-7, they, they took him round four. Malik McDowell, who they took their first pick a couple of years ago, a 4-5-3 at nearly 300 pounds. Again, sensational times. So if people are looking for the interior pass rushers, and those kind of inside-out defensive ends who could be on the radar for the Seahawks, look at the short shuttle, look at the 10-yard splits. They seem to be the things, as well as the explosive tests, that really matter for the Seahawks. So why are the defensive line drills your favorite ones to watch in the combine? I think you just learn so much. I mean, when you, when you watch the senior bowl, the best drill is without doubt the 1v1s, the defensive linemen against the offensive linemen. But uh, all of the positions get some 1v1s and you can learn things about all of them. At the combine, it's very hard. You don't learn a great deal from the quarterback, for example. They just The only thing you find out is about their arm strength throwing downfield. The receivers, you can learn about the pass catching technique. But again, they're not coming up against any defenders. So you're not really seeing if they can properly separate. You're not seeing how they compete. Um, the running back drills, you know, they're cutting against pads. The defensive packs... Backpedal important, how they use their hips, important. But again, they're not covering anybody, so it's really difficult. The great thing about the defensive linemen is that their movement skills, their agility, their ability to to punch with power, to, to get their hands into the right areas, their ability to, can you swim rip with, does it look natural? Um, everything about the bag drills and, and those swim rip drills and their agility testing and the way that they move, it's all really useful. I mean, the combine, I, I watch every bit of the combine, and, it, and I can tell you, it's a real chore sometimes. The defensive bat drills are amongst the most boring things you will ever watch. I mean, they just go on for like two or three hours. And um, once you've seen whether a guy's got loose hips and can back pedal, there's not a great deal left to learn from that from an amateur scouting point of view. I'm sure the teams have got loads of things that they take from it. But from my point of view, I get pretty bored by it. The defensive line, I'm on the edge of my seat watching this. It's just, it, you just learn so much from the guys here. You can see who are the ones who stand out. You can see which guys are, are really, really sort of the top players amongst a really loaded class. And the other great thing about this year, as I mentioned, is there were just so many first round picks in this group that it's going to be a treat to watch them work out. Well, I know one guy that I'm going to be watching is Montez Sweat because he seems to be a popular name that's coming up for the Seahawks in terms of the mock drafts. And... I think having a, an edge rusher opposite of Frank Clark would be uh, a definite asset. I'm, I'm just curious about the guy because because of the fact that he's coming up so often in these mock drafts as toward the Seahawks. Yeah, I think the Seahawks would almost certainly have some interest in him. He's a, he's a really interesting player overall because he's got incredible arm length, you know, unnatural arm length, which is a real asset. His quickness off the, off the snap is really, really good. He, he's a, a fantastic speed rusher. And I think he's actually a little bit better and he's, he uses his length really well. He's actually a little bit better against the run than maybe some people give him credit for. And for those reasons, if he has a great combine, it's, it's not unrealistic that he goes in the top 15 because there aren't many humans like Montez Sweat. Um, but there are some question marks as well. He needs to have a good combine because he's a smaller defensive end. He's, he's about 250 pounds. A lot of the top pass rushers in the NFL, if you look at sack statistics, they're, they're a lot bigger than this. You know, they've probably got 20 pounds on Montez mm, Sweat. Mm-hmm. He's, he's a, he needs to prove that he's a Daniil Hunter-level athlete if he's going to convince teams to take him early. I think he probably will do that. The other thing he's got to do is he's got to convince teams that they want to buy into him as a person. He had quite a weird departure from Michigan State, and there are some lingering character concerns there, you know, whether it's focus, whether it's, you know, how, how determined is he to be great? I think these are things that teams will want to figure out the combine. And, if, and I'm convinced the Seahawks will certainly be one of the teams right at the front of the queue trying to learn a lot about him because right now he's a player that I think is probably going to go between 20 and 40. He, you know, pass rushers do last sometimes longer than people are projecting. I'm not buying into all the top 10 talk at the moment. If he has a really convincing combine and interviews well, then the sky's the limit for Montez Sweat. So he's a player who could really improve his stock. And he certainly is a player that Seahawks fans should be keeping an eye on. But there's, there's loads. I mean, you could run through so many different names that the Seahawks could be interested in from this great defensive line group. It's, it's just going to be fascinating to see which ones test well. They can maybe just get a little edge, a little bit up the ladder and, and, and jump a few players you know, I, I could give you some names. I mean, I think people like LJ Collier has got great tape, had a fantastic senior bowl from TCU, great arm length. 
I'm, I can't wait to see how he works out to see if he's a good enough athlete for the Seahawks to even consider with their first pick. I think if he can test very well, he is somebody that they need to consider. You've got the Clemson guys. You know, I think Dexter Lawrence is going to have an amazing combine and he's going to be the talk of the com- one of the players that the talk of the combine after the D-line group workout. I think Christian Wilkins is going to wow everybody. Kalen Saunders, the, the guy who does the backflips, who had a great senior bowl. Can't wait to see him work out. I wonder if Christian Miller's working out at Alabama, another edge type guy who was very similar to Montez Sweat in terms of his length, frame, ability to rush the edge, good against the run. Um, Gerald Willis the third at Miami is is I think destined to have a great workout. God, there was there were just so many players who, who were going to shine at this combat. I, I can't wait to see the D-line group. Well, moving on to linebacker, an interesting place this offseason because there is I mean apart from Bobby Wagner and even Bobby Wagner he's going into the final year of his contract and KJ Wright not knowing the status of him and free agency uh, I by by the draft at least will have an idea of where KJ Wright is if he's staying in Seattle or if he's going but Barkevius Mingo there's even questions with him you know is he going to be a potential cap casualty so what do you think in terms of linebacker? Is that a position where the Seahawks may go early or I mean, I guess it's just going to be have, have to be one of those things where you wait and see after free agency. It's an intriguing position because a couple of years ago, Pete Carroll said, we need to, we need to draft some youth for this position. You know, we can't have Bobby Wagner and KJ Wright playing 100% of the snaps again. And they never really went and got, got younger at the yeah, linebacker it, it, spot after he said that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so here's the thing. Wagner played 99% of the defensive snaps in 2016 and Wright played 97%. And then Carroll says they need to add some youth to the position. They didn't do anything in the um, 2017 draft. And then Wagner does 93% of the snaps in 2017 and 93 in 2018. Wright had 87% in 2017. So he, he's dropped a little bit. And obviously 2018, he spent most of the year injured. But Bobby Wagner is still doing pretty much the same snaps as he's always done. And the only linebacker they've taken since Carroll made those comments is Shaquem Griffin, who was more of a, you know, like a nickel linebacker, nickel rush type at UCF um, and more of a, a key special team. Right? I don't personally believe that Shaquem Griffin is somebody who's going to be a, you know, a full-time starter at linebacker in the future. So they've not really addressed this at all in the two years since Will, um, since Carroll made those, those comments. So I still think it, and, and with Wright now, I think KJ Wright's going to get paid and I think he's going to move on. Yeah. And I think he will probably leave the team. Um, and then it, it's Michael Kendricks or Bust, really. I mean, I, I'm not sure. Maybe I think they've gone for a Thomas Davis type player who can be a stopgap. I'm not sure. Um, Kendricks, we have to wait and see what happens with his, his obviously with the potential a, a prison sentence. If he avoids that, I think it's a good chance he will come back to the Seahawks and that will be, that'd be a great... A, player to have back he had a, a very good season for the Seahawks but they need to add some linebackers uh they do have very specific again as we've talked about with other positions they have a very specific profile that they look for you know they they like athletes they, they like guys who are running in like the four fours they like guys who test very well in the in the vertical jump like 39 inches is as a barometer of the type of great athlete mm-hmm. they've looked for at this position um, KG Wright is really the anomaly because he did not have a great combine but he had great length so if, is there a linebacker in this class who's got fantastic arm length who maybe hasn't quite got the athleticism of some of the other players like Wagner um, Kevin Pierre Lewis Corey Toomer Malcolm Smith Eric Pinkins all these players that they've taken in the past but has he got the length um, that could make up for that a little bit so you know, I, I think there are players in this class that could intrigue them Devin Bush at Michigan is a smaller he's got a similar frame to Michael Kendricks, electric speed, great potential, not especially good in coverage despite his speed, but very tenacious and a player that they could mold. Uh, it's got NFL bloodlines as well. Mac Wilson, very interesting player, Brandon, because I cannot believe how good he is in coverage for his size. I mean, just, just to watch him move around in coverage is incredible. There's, if people want to check this out, go onto YouTube and type in Mac Wilson rivals so rivals are the high school recruiting group who who offer the stars you know they determine who's like a three mm-hmm. four five star recruit they have put a video recently of mac wilson working out in linebacker coverage drills when he was in high school he already looked like an nfl linebacker with a size and the way that he was covering receivers in space was like that of a defensive back alabama last year were putting him as a single high safety in third downs because they trust him that much in coverage 
I don't think that he's a 4-4 runner or anything. I don't think that he's a particularly fast linebacker. I just think that he's incredible shiftiness. He covers a lot of space in a, in a short space of time. So I just think that he's an incredibly intriguing player. I can't wait to see him test because I actually think he is somebody that, if it's not the Seahawks, I could see someone like the Baltimore Ravens looking at him either in the late first or the early second round. You know, the Packers maybe, you know, teams of that ilk looking for, for someone like Mac Wilson. And I think he could be somebody that could be a target for the Seahawks simply because I think he's very ideally suited to that will position, can cover very well, can play the run. I thought his 2018 tape overall was a little bit disappointing, but there's so much potential there with Mac Wilson that I think he's somebody that you, you consider working with. And then just a few other names, Terrell Hanks, a New Mexico State, smaller school guy, decent character, can't wait to see how he tests because he's got incredible arm length, similar arm length to KJ Wright, could be one of those players that they look at. Bobby Okariki had a decent senior bowl at Stanford. Again, great arm length, appears to have decent speed on tape. Let's see how he works out at the combine. And then a, a bit of a wild card, Voshan Joseph from Florida. I don't think many people expected him to declare for the draft. He's generally considered to be like a third round type, but he's smaller, maybe more of like a Dion Jones, an Atlanta type of player, Gets around the field, physical, tough for his size, um, gets sideline to sideline, willing to put his helmet in in the running game. Very intriguing player. I'm looking forward to see if he can run a really fast time. What about a guy like Jermaine Pratt from North Carolina State? You know, you talk about length. You know, he's 6'3", uh, 245, had a pretty good season last year with over 100 tackles at NC State. Mm. Uh, 10, 10 tackles for a loss, over six sacks. Do you, someone like him maybe for the, as a potential K.J. Wright replacement? I think he's expected to have a good test at the Combine as well. He's another player to keep an eye out for. The problem with him is when I watched him on tape is that you would see some really excellent plays. Like you will see him blow up a screen, read the play really well, disengage from a you know a potential blocker, dump the running back in the backfield, and you think, wow, that's a really cool play. And then you will see on the very next down, he'll go headfirst charging to fill a gap in the running game. Um, a pulling tight end will absolutely wipe him out. He's not seen it coming. He ends up flat on his back. And it's a major, you know, 20 yard run as a consequence because he just lost contain of his gap being too aggressive. And you just see that over and over and over again with him. Great plays mixed in with horrendous plays. And I think for him to be a consideration, he's got to become more consistent. It took him a long time to become a starter at NC State. His final year was really the year where he, it all came together for him. But I think he's very much a developmental player who's got potential, who's going to go later in the draft but someone who might need a lot of time to work on it and has just got to become more consistent. I'd almost take him having a few of these sort of very exciting tackle for a loss plays if he could just eliminate some of the really ugly plays that you also see in his tape. Yeah, I wonder in those types of situations, you know, is that is that a coaching issue more than a performance issue? It could be. It, it very easily could be. And that's something that teams, when they watch him, they will have to determine. I'm, I'm sure that... You know, very experienced GM scouts and coaches will be able to say, OK, that's because of the scheme that they're using here that maybe has put him into a bad position or they'll be able to read when, for example, when he's extremely aggressive and he ends up getting caught out as a consequence of his aggressiveness, they may well be able to determine, OK, that's just because that's what he, the role that he's asked to do. Therefore, we'll let him off with that. My sort of amateur eye to, to this was sort of seeing that he, his instincts were wrong at times that he was sort of making decisions and and, uh, and deciding when to be aggressive and was making bad decisions as a consequence, that the, it's just not a good look when you see a linebacker of his size being smashed at the line of scrimmage and being dumped on his backside. You just don't see sort of many... I mean, when's the last time you saw sort of KJ Wright and Bobby Wagner do that, even as rookies in, uh, in college? Right. It doesn't happen very often. And when he's getting blown up at the line of scrimmage because he's been a bit too aggressive in trying to fill a gap rather than just sort of standing there, letting the play develop. If you watch Bobby Wagner, I, mean, I think um, uh, the videos, I'm trying to remember the guy's um, Baldy. Uh, he, oh, he would Ryan do the, the videos and he would he would sort of say, here's why Bobby Wagner's amazing. And Bobby Wagner's kind of like stood still. And the, the ball snapped and Bobby Wagner still stood still. And he lets the play develop. And then he makes his move. And he's such a good athlete that he can let the play develop read and react and still make a tackle for a loss and be the best player on the defense. Jermaine Pratt for me was a, a player who was almost the complete opposite of that. He was sort of trying to anticipate plays, trying to get a, a head start, trying to make a jump, trying to use his athletic skills to create an advantage. And it often got him into trouble and an offense could say, 
probably see things on tape and say, look how aggressive he is in this type of play. If we call this play, we'd be able to pull a tight end and wipe him out and he's going to be dumped in his backside and there's a free running lane for us. And I think that that's the difference between someone like Wagner and Pratt. Um, I like aspects of his game. As I mentioned, he has some really good TFLs, as you discussed. Um, as, uh, his defense against screens in particular, when you sort of see his length and his his athleticism and his power come together, is very impressive. That said, I, I think he's a guy who needs an awful lot of work. Well, another guy that's had some nice TFLs is uh, DeAndre Walker from Georgia. Now, it doesn't sound like he's going to be participating in the combine. He didn't even play in the Sugar Bowl with a groin injury. What are some of your thoughts on Walker? Uh, DeAndre Walker, I really like. You know, I, I think that he's he's a player who deserves a lot more credit than he's been getting. I think that he's somebody, if he'd, if he'd been able to attend the Senior Bowl and was able to work out the combine, could have really boosted his stock. He had a terrific game against Alabama um, in in a game that really I think Georgia should have won. And you sort of see time and time again, he does a decent job against the run. He doesn't play brilliantly against the run every down, but for a guy his size, I think he does an admirable job. I think that as a pass rusher, he's underrated. I think that he's better than some of the, the more highly touted pass rushers. You see someone like Josh Allen's being almost considered a top 10 lock these days. And uh, Josh Allen's a really good football player, but I, you see him getting destroyed by tight ends in the running game. And you're thinking, how, how are you going to be able to line Josh Allen up in a 4-3? How, how are you going to be able to put Josh Allen on the line and say, on first down, we trust this, trust this guy to be able to play a very simple uh, um, defense against the run? When, when he, a tight end in college is destroying him. Josh Allen had a terrible game against Georgia because he was just getting wiped out in the running game. You just don't see DeAndre Walker do that. He's very stout, very physical, holds his point, uses his length well, can get off the line and make plays in the run. But he's also a really speedy pass rusher too. So I think that he's somebody who could fall a little bit because he just hasn't been able to gain any kind of momentum throughout this process because he, he's been injured, hasn't been able to play at the senior bowl, hasn't, isn't going to be able to work out at the combine. But I really like him, and I think he is somebody that can play a little bit of linebacker, can play a little bit of up front and play pass rush as well. Might be kind of that Sam Leo type of player. We need to see how he measures. Has he got the arm length that the Seahawks look for? They've never drafted a defensive lineman with sub 33 inch arms. I don't think they're going to draft him if he's kind of like a 32 inch arms. Um, it would be nice to see him do a workout at the pro day, see if he can run a 40, see if he can do some of the agility testing as well, some of the explosive testing to get a, an, an angle on just what kind of an athlete he is. But he's a very interesting player at Georgia. It's funny you mentioned that about Josh Allen because I went and looked at Jalen Jelks, who the Seahawks reportedly met with after the senior bowl. And I thought the exact same thing. You know, he's lining up against tight ends and has has no <laughs> is having no success against college tight ends. And yet, you know, here's a guy that's you know being considered for <laughs> as a potential pass rusher. And and I did see a lot of athleticism that I really liked at you know where you'd uh, where you'd think that he's out of a play, and then all of a sudden he comes from behind and takes a guy down. But I don't see it quite with him either. Yeah, I, I, listen, I'm, I'm not trying to suggest for a second that I've got all the answers and, you know, I get a lot plenty of, plenty wrong and I, I'm not in any way sort of an expert on this, but I, I just don't see what some people have, I, I don't, I can't fathom what some people think. And people were talking about Jalen Jelks as a first round draft pick during the season. And you kind of, in a lot of mock drafts, especially in preseason before 2018, you were seeing people talk about Jalen Jelks as a first round pick. And I'm exactly the same as you. When I watched him play, I was thinking, doesn't beat tight ends just seems to, to he's just so stalled at the line. You know, he's not got any get off. Like he's almost like overthinking things and his pass rush off the edge. And when, and if you're going to do that, if you're not going to sort of attack the, the, the offensive tackle, try and beat him with speed, get into his pads, win with speed power. If, if, if you're going to do an inside move, get on with it. And I, I kind of watch him. I'm thinking, what's he, what are you doing? Just get in there. Let's show us something. Attack the offensive tackle. Do something. He's kind of thinking about what he's going to do. And then by the time he engages the offensive tackle, he's got into his set and he just shuts him down. And I, I just didn't see anything really that made me think this is a high draft pick. And when Josh Allen, look, there's plenty to like for Josh Allen. He's an incredible athlete. I think he's taken his ability to sort of set up offensive tackles is great. He sort of thinks two or three plays ahead. He's definitely got some some ability to rush the edge. I think as an athlete, he's going to have a great combine. I think there's every chance that he will almost certainly go in the top 12 picks and be a very high draft selection. Uh, but when I see him being projected to 4-3 teams and to 4-3 teams in the top five, 
I start to think, you know, that's a bit rich for me because I, I've seen tight ends handle this guy in the run game and in the pass game. And, and that just bothers me. How is he going to handle the, the, the tight ends and the offensive tackles in the NFL? And uh, for me, I think his best fit without shadow of a doubt, Josh Allen, this is, is in is a 3-4 offensive linebacker where he can play in space a little bit more and do some pass rushing rather than playing like as a Leo or as a 4-3 defensive end. Well, and that's what made me think of Jelks maybe more as a you know a KJ Wright type fill in player than than a guy who you know, would be a, a complimentary pass rusher along with Frank Clark because he definitely seemed to shine more in, in stopping the run than he did in, in rushing the passer. And I, I'm curious to see what what happens at linebacker for the Seahawks for sure in this draft. They they have to do something. You know, they, this is gonna they are going to do something at linebacker. Whether it's re-signing KJ Wright, whether it's re-signing Michael Kendricks, whether it's going out and getting a free agent, whether it's creating some extra depth there, whether it's spending a high draft pick on the position, they're going to do something. You know, it's it's a position that you put a ring around and say one way or another this is going to get addressed. They don't don't have the answers on the roster at the moment. They're not going to go into next season with Shaquem Griffin as the starting will or Austin Calitro or Barkevius Mingo. That's that's not going to happen. There has to be some work here at the linebacker position. It's one of the positions they have to address. So what I, I think that the depth at linebacker this year isn't particularly good. There's probably like four to five names that are going to go in the first two rounds. Then there's going to be a bit of a drop off, mm. but they may well be able to find the physical profiles later on that they do like if they don't end up taking one early. And and that's what we have to look at. You know, that we, we know the kind of players that they like. They're like big time athletes at linebacker. The short shuttle is very, very important. It seems based on sort of the, I think the NFL in general sees the short shuttle as important uh, for linebackers, it's not surprising. You know, short area quickness and agility is very important. Um, so it's, it's it's a position to certainly keep an eye on at this combine. Well, moving on to cornerback, this is another position where the Seahawks definitely have a type, and that has to do with their arm length, their wingspan, and so they they like those long corners. Yeah, I, I, length and and really sort of size is is important. I think we all know by now what constitutes the Seahawks corner. Um, a year ago at the Combine, as I mentioned earlier, I absolutely detested watching the cornerbacks work out. It was, it was a lousy session. None of them really impressed. None of them ran particularly fast. It was a huge departure from the previous year when the cornerback class was the, you know, the golden position in the whole draft. Um, it was a major disappointment a year ago. And then the safeties came out. This guy called Trey Flowers ran a 40 and started doing the back pedal. And he just thought, wow, that guy looks like a Seahawks corner. He was the, he was the prototype. And, and I remember doing it in the live blog saying, that guy's a Seahawks corner. And, and then sort of putting me in a, in a number of seven round mark drafts because he, just because he looked like a Seahawks corner. And then the whole they drafted him to be a Seahawks cornerback. So not a surprise at all. I think, again, whether you're looking at cornerbacks or safeties, kind of look for that Trey Flowers type body frame, which is very, very tall, 33, 34 inch arms. Is there anybody like that in this draft class? And, um, and, and, and if they kind of got that lean, natural athleticism, and um, I think there will be some players in this draft that have got that um, wingspan and arm length. You know, they're not going to draft a cornerback with sub 32 inch arms to play outside. Uh, wingspan is probably going to be in sort of the 78 inch minimum uh, for a wingspan, which is sort of the tip of the fingers to the shoulders. So, you know, they're going to look for those types of players. The other question mark is inside. You know, Justin Coleman's a free agent. What are they going to do there? If Coleman walks, are they just going to? leave it to chance in free agency. Are they going to do another trade like they did with Coleman? Is there somebody that they have on the roster currently that they can sort of work into that position? Coleman did not have 32 inch arms, kind of like 31 right. and a bit inch arms, 5'11", 185 when he did his combine. So they look for different players inside. I actually wonder if they may look for a safety convert to sort of play in that role. So not necessarily a big nickel type, perhaps somebody who is of a cornerback size that has played safety, who is capable of playing in that nickel type of role. An awful lot of safeties in college are being converted to nickel. Chauncey, Chauncey Gardner, uh, Johnson at Florida is an example of that. Played safety up until last season, then they moved into nickel last year. Uh, Buddha Baker was another one of those who kind of played predominantly nickel, having been originally a safety. You see Jonathan Abram at Mississippi State playing a lot in nickel. This is the way that college football is going. And I think this is the way that the NFL is eventually going to go as well. And we're going to see a lot of these college safeties used almost as nickel cornerbacks. And I want one sort of name I'm going to throw out there. He's actually going to work out with the safeties, but I'm sort of thinking he may be a potential cornerback for the Seahawks in the nickel is Marvell Tell, who is at USC, captain, great character, 
Um, I think his skill set suits the playing inside in the nickel. So I think he's somebody that the Seahawks could seriously look at if they lose Justin Coleman to sort of move inside and play nickel corner. Yeah, with Gardner Johnson, that player is intriguing because his because of his versatility, right? You know, somebody that could match up in the slot, but maybe even stay on the field as a safety on on base downs. Now, uh, in terms of other corners, what about uh, Justin Lane as a, a potential late round corner option? Yeah, I've watched a bit of him, and, and I have to say, I thought his tape was was pretty average overall. You know, not a player to be particularly excited about, but then. You know, I, I think that's that's really it. I mean, the Seahawks um, have had one cornerback in Richard Sherman, who was obviously incredible at taking the ball away, and, and an exciting defensive back who who creates turnovers. Everybody's looking for that. And then Byron Maxwell, who equally was was kind of very capable of forcing turnovers. But a lot of the other corners they've had have been, you know, that they've been very disciplined in working the scheme, but haven't necessarily been turnover machines. And when I see Lane. I kind of see a bit of that, you know, he's, he's very good at working within the scheme, but doesn't, isn't that much of a playmaker. And, mm-hmm. and I do think the Seahawks do see some value in that, in being a disciplined corner. So I think that Lane could be on the radar as long as he has the sort of all the measurements that they look for. Uh, Jamal Peters at Mississippi State just screams Seahawks. I mean, just this frame, the way that he plays the game, um, his tackling ability. I wouldn't be surprised at all if the Seahawks drafted Jamal Peters to provide some competition for Shaquille, uh, Shaquille Griffin and for Trey Flowers. Um, Rocky Sin has got the arm length. He's got a great name. He's a cornerback at Temple who is pretty physical as well. I'm just wondering whether or not he's perhaps, although he's got the arm length, he's not quite the long athlete that they've looked for, unlike Jamal Peters, unlike Justin Lane, unlike Lonnie Johnson, who is at Kentucky as well, who had a really good senior ball. I think he's potentially going to be on their radar. And there's a player called Joe John Williams at Vanderbilt, who again, very lean, long armed, kind of looks like a Seahawks corner. His stock seems to be moving very much upwards towards the first round range. Previously been seen as like a third round prospect. If he has a good combine and goes into the first round, that's not going to be a, a Seahawks option. But if he does survive into sort of round three or four, maybe he doesn't quite have the combine that he hopes for, he could be a player the Seahawks look at as well. Moving back to safety, what do you see as a better option for the Seahawks? Either moving McDougal to free safety and drafting somebody like uh, Juan Thornhill, University of Virginia, having him play the strong side, or having McDougal on the strong side and drafting a, a more typical free safety prospect like Deontay Thompson for Alabama. Or, you know, we brought up Chauncey Gardner Johnson, you know, that could play a more versatile role. Well, first of all, I will say I think this is a pretty lousy looking safety class overall. And this is not the, the year for me to be. Sort of really targeting safety early because there, there are players that you could sort of make a case for and, and, and Garner Johnson is one of those. I really like him as a character, talks a lot of smack on the field, but in a good way, you know, he's not, he's not a cocky player. He's just really competitive, really physical for his size, quite good range. We'll be very interested to see how fast he runs because he's a smaller player. So you want to see him run really fast for his size. Um, but I had a very good career at, at Florida and, and a player that I like an awful lot. There are one or two others. Taylor Rapp at, at Washington, like the look of him. Jonathan Abram, I don't think either of those two are going to run particularly well, though I'm probably more strong than um, free safeties or, or sort of that big nickel type player rather than, than playing free. I actually think the Seahawks probably like their safeties more than the fans and the media. And I, and I know a lot of mock drafts are saying the Seahawks will take a safety the first round. A lot of them saying that it's a priority position. I actually think that Pete Cowell probably still has a degree of faith in Delano Hill. I think that the way that Hill finished strongly yeah. 2018 season showed that he's probably going to be part of their plans. I certainly don't think they're giving up on Tedrick Thompson. I think they'd probably like to see a bit more playmaking from Tedrick Thompson, especially given how he was a turnover machine in, in college for Colorado. I think they want to see a bit more of that from him. But I think they like those two players. And I think with McDougal kind of tying down at least one of the positions, they're probably pretty comfortable to go into next year with that kind of group. Maybe add one more at some point for a bit of competition there. Shalom Lawani's still with the team as well, of course. Maybe add another player to add some competition there. But that could be a day three. It may be a Marquise Blair type from Utah. Very, very physical, very long. It could be Marvell Tell again, as I mentioned, who could play maybe a bit of nickel, compete at safety as well. You know, it could be a player like that a little bit later on rather than sort of the, the, the Gardner Johnson in round two or Abram in round two or Rapp in the top 40. That's kind of how I'm viewing this. So I think that they will take one a little bit later on. We've talked a lot about positions where it's very obvious to work out what a Seahawks type is. Safety is actually probably the hardest position 
to work out what a Seahawks type is because all of the safeties that they've drafted have been very, very different. Arm length's been different. Speed's been different. Range has been different. There's no consistency there at all. So predicting what the Seahawks will actually take in a safety is very, very difficult. I want to mention one other thing as well. You know, a lot of people think when they talk about safeties, they talk about speed because Earl Thomas was at such amazing range, was like a 4-3-9 runner at his, his pro day and a 4-4 runner in the combine. And people think you've got to have speed at free safety. It's, it's, the, it's the be all and end all. I actually don't think that's the case. There aren't actually that many great, fast, rangy safeties. They just aren't. I mean, like people like Keanu Neal, for example, one of the better young safeties in the NFL, mm-hmm. ran a similar time to Tedrick Thompson. And then when you actually look at, I went through and, and, and listed the top 15 performers in the 40-yard in the dash at, amongst the safeties at the Combine since 2010. And we actually run through the names. You know, how many of these players, and these are the fastest 40 times by safeties since Carroll took over in Seattle, how many of these names ring out as players that stand out? So Troy Akpa, 434. TJ Green, who was with the Seahawks and has retired since. Justin Cox, 436. Natural Jameson, 440. Obi Melifonwu, 440. Justin Reed, 440. Dane Cruikshank, 441. Josh Jones, 441. Terrence Brooks, 442. Monte Nicholson, 442. Shamarco Thomas, 442. Taylor Mays, 443. Earl Wolf, 444. You know, none of these players are, you know, elite None safeties. of those are jumping out as stars, Rob. <laughs> yeah. How, how many pro bowlers are, are amongst that list? Yeah, zero. And, and that's the thing. So, you know, actually, how important is speed? How, how important is that for this position? And I don't have an answer for that. You know, I'd love to speak to a defensive back expert or somebody who's coached or scouted that position in particular to find out exactly what teams are looking for. Because I'm sure a really fast fantastic free safety like Earl Thomas is is great but they're so rare you you aren't going to find another player like that so I actually think that we probably have to be looking at different things for free safety and it's also probably another reason why I think they're probably quite comfortable playing Bradley McDougall at free safety even though he's not a fast player or even a Tedrick Thompson because I just don't think that I think speed's probably a little bit overrated at safety Mm -hmm. and we have to look for other things yeah, decision making, you know, the types of angles that they take on on going after the, the ball carrier. Uh, and you're not going to get those out of watching the combine either. So, yeah, definitely a, an interesting position for the Seahawks. And I can see where a lot of the, uh, the the people who are projecting the draft for the Seahawks who look at the defensive back group for Seattle and they say, well, you know, they have a lot of nice complementary players um, and a lot of depth at all of those positions. But if Earl Thomas moves on like we expect him to, they're going to be now lacking that star in the secondary. And maybe they don't necessarily need that. You know, maybe having the stars on the defensive line and at linebacker is more important. But I could see why you just based on the history where people would say, well, that's the position they need to add to them. Yeah, it's it's an uncomfortable position for Seahawks fans to be because we're kind of used to the LOB. You know, we're used to them having not just one star at the defensive back positions, but like four stars or, or at least three stars. Um, and to have kind of none, although I, I think Bradley McDougall has warranted some respect as maybe like one of the key players on the defense but to have to have no you know genuine all pro amazing you know best of a generation type defensive backs haven't had Thomas Chancellor and Sherman for so long is an unnerving position but I I think that this team is is taking a slightly different personality and is going in a different direction I think that if you give Carroll an elite uh, group of defensive backs he'll say yeah I'll take that I can work with that and we'll build around it but I also think if you said, look, you're going to have to coach up some guys and and work on it at defensive back, and hey, do you know what? You're going to get a great defensive line. I think he'll do that as well. And I think this time at USC is a good example of that. There were times when he had big-name safeties, big-name defensive backs who he was working with, and they were the stars on the defense. He also had great front seven defenders who were the stars in the five-star recruits who helped him have a lot of success. So I think that probably the identity of this defense going forward is probably going to be Bobby Wagner. It's probably going to be Frank Clark. It's probably going to be Jaron Reed. And it's going to be whoever else they can add to that front seven to take this team forward. And probably what that's going to be the, you know, the, the LOB, if you want to call it that. And the defensive backs are going to be guys that are probably just fit certain profiles that they feel they can coach and work with and be disciplined within their system. I think the one thing that I would like to see them find whether it's from the existing group or from anybody they add, it's just somebody who can be a playmaker. You know, somebody who you feel can get four to five interceptions to add to what you're already getting from your McDougals and players like that. 
it felt like they were never particularly close in the second half mm-hmm. of the season to getting turnovers in the defensive back group. And that's something that they've, they've had an issue with for a long time now. Whether that's creating more pressure to force those turnovers or whether it's getting more players in the defensive backfield to create those turnovers by just being better there, I don't know what the answer is to that. But I think it'd be great to see a playmaker added to the front seven to be a pass rusher and a playmaker added to the back of the defense as well to, to create those turnovers. Well, and one thing I want to point out too, that with the defensive backs, I don't know if we get to a, another point to where they have a, a legion of boom again because of the fact that when they drafted Earl Thomas at number 14 back in 2010, the Seahawks haven't had a draft pick at 14 or higher. Uh, apart from Bruce Irvin, they, when they had the 12th pick and they moved back to number 15 to take Irvin, they, they just haven't drafted that early. And they, it's because they've been in a position where they haven't been that bad as a team. And so getting Earl Thomas as early as they did, uh, I mean, every time that they've drafted 15 or higher, they've ended up with a Pro Bowl caliber player. So that's changed. And then the other thing that's changed is the type of you know, back when the Seahawks were taking Richard Sherman, Cam Chancellor, nobody was looking at defensive backs that were that big and and long. They were all looking, you know, primarily for for shorter type players and guys with speed. So they were working on a different level as most other teams uh, back in 2010, 2011. Oh, yeah. The, the, they changed the league, you know, and the, it, it seems like Seahawks fans spend a lot of time these days kind of criticizing Pete Carroll and and. Um, sort of second guessing his philosophy and, and what he wants to do, especially on offense. But I think people uh, have, have forgotten too easily how much they've changed the NFL. And, and one of the ways that they've changed the NFL is with the defensive backs. And as you, as you rightly say, 2010 to 2012, they kind of had their pick of all the big, tall, long cornerbacks that they could ever want and the big physical safety um, and stuff like that. And then everybody was looking for that. And then, Pete Carroll's coaches like Dan Quinn, for example, became head coaches and then they'd be looking for those specific type players as well. So they're working from a very different environment than they were in the past. The other thing people need to remember is, I hear it often said that free safety is such an important piece of Pete Carroll's defense. The Seahawks, when they drafted Earl Thomas, they weren't aggressive in drafting him. You know, the Eagles traded one place above them, everybody assumed, that was to take Earl Thomas. It was actually to go and get Brandon Graham. So they, they risked not ever having Earl Thomas quite easily by waiting until 14. And if it was such an important position for them, they probably would have taken Earl Thomas at number six or they would have traded up a couple of spots to get Eric Berry. They didn't do that. Um, they, they were quite comfortable sort of sitting and, and allowing that situation to play out. And now they're very willing to let Earl Thomas leave as a free agent. You know, if, if he was such, if free safety was such an important position for Carroll, I don't think they would have allowed this Earl Thomas situation to play out as it has. So I actually think that they're quite comfortable with the safety position and with other holes in the team, as we've discussed, defensive line, linebacker, potentially receiver, tight end, potentially offensive line, maybe quarterback because of Wilson's future. I actually think what they will probably do this year, considering it's a bad safety class, as I mentioned, is they will either just trust the guys that they've got or it'll be a day three pick to come in and compete rather than an early pick like a lot of people are projecting. I don't think that you know the likes of Deontay Thompson, Nasir Adderley, Jonathan Abram, Taylor Rapp are going to be with the Seahawks. I think they're going to go in a different direction with their first pick. And we're probably going to see it may be a Marquise Blair. It might be somebody else on day three to come in and compete. Well, you brought up Nasir Adderley's name, and that's a, a guy that they spoke to after the Senior Bowl. Ross Wilberding emails in and asks, what am I missing on Adderley? I've only watched three games I could find online from last year numerous times. Don't understand the hype. Has great range, yet never seems to be anywhere near close to the ball and seems to want nothing to do with defending the run. I see a late round developmental pick, but I see him constantly mocked as a first rounder. Please help me see what I'm missing. You're not missing anything. You've got it absolutely spot on. That's exactly what I see as well. I have no idea where the hype's coming from. Yeah, I, I suspect, you know, without wanting to do anybody down, it's because people have probably watched his highlights videos more than they have watched the tape mm-hmm. like you have. And if you watch one of his highlights videos, he makes incredible plays. There's one amazing kick return that he has uh, where he kind of smashes into a defender on the sideline, dumps him on his backside, and then continues the run and runs the length of the field for a touchdown. It's an amazing play. There, there are interceptions that he makes that look really good. And you put all these together in a five-minute highlight tape, 
and you think, wow, this is the best safety to come into the league in years. And then you actually watch the tape and you think, ah, his range isn't quite as good. And like you say, the running game stuff isn't quite there. And, you know, where is the, I'm, I'm waiting to sort of see something that really blows me away. And when you're sort of looking at smaller school guys, you want to see them destroying opponents and, and really standing out. Marcus Davenport a year ago really did. And that's why he ended up going in the top 20 and the Saints actually spent two first round picks to acquire him. I didn't see anything like that with Nasser Adderley. I mean, I, I, for me, he's kind of like a mid round at best player who, like you say, you come in and you develop. So I, I'm not seeing this at all. I don't know where this has come from, but you know, six months ago, everybody was saying Deontay Thompson was a top 20 lock and a, a possible top 10 safety pick. Nobody believes that anymore. Nasir Adderley was a first round pick a few weeks ago. I think people are now realizing that probably isn't the case and he didn't have a great senior bowl. Um, I've seen receivers tout, you know, people like Harmon at NC State touted as a top 10 pick at various points. That's never going to happen in a million years. I, I, I've been a little bit confused by some of the some of the reports and some of the analysts and the pundits and what they've been saying on the internet over the last few months. And um, I, I can't say that I've seen anything that Will hasn't seen from Nazir Adelie. I completely agree with it. Well, Rob, a couple questions before we get on out of here. Uh, Ross Bell asks uh, from over in your part of the country, is it worth me staying up to watch the draft this year? The inevitability of us trading back is making me think not so much at the moment. <laughs> Well, you see, I would, as someone who is a bit of a draft bore, I would say, yeah, definitely stay up for it because I mean, I think it's just great entertainment, you know, seeing who, who drafts who in the first round. And you're, you kind of want to be there for, to sort of react. I know the Seahawks probably are going to trade down and maybe even out of round one again. There's not going to be a player specifically to talk about, but I always kind of find it interesting to sort of have a look who's left at the end of the day. So let's say that if they traded from 21 down to 35, just to throw a number out there. By the end of the first round, you, you say, OK, the Seahawks are going to be on the clock in, in two or three picks time. Who's left for them to take? And you know, a couple of years ago when they traded down and, and took Malik McDowell, it was very interesting to sort of consider some of the players that were left on the board to take overnight and to think what they might do. And it kind of increased that excitement. You have the excitement of building up towards the draft and then to have an extra night to sort of consider who the Seahawks are going to take with their first pick, I find pretty uh, entertaining but um not for everybody it's a, it's a late night when you live over here you know last year i was in florida for the draft so it was a little bit different it finished in a, in a reasonable time uh, usually when you stay up over here for the first round of the nfl draft you kind of go to bed at five <laughs> o'clock in the morning so i can understand why it's not for everybody but i wouldn't miss it for the world yeah, do you have any trips to the u.s planned for this year now uh not this year sadly but um it was definitely one of my one of my favorite draft experiences was being in the states in florida watching the build up, you know, at a reasonable hour. Um, the, my family were with me, but they all went out and kind of left me to it. And, and I kind of had the whole place to myself to watch the draft and um, really enjoyed it. And, and the Seahawks actually picked someone in the first round last year. So there was a player to talk about at the end of round one. I'll see when, uh, when you have Las Vegas on, on slate for the draft in 2020. See, that's the one to make it over for Rob. Yeah. You see, that'd be good. Yeah. If, uh, you know, I, I, I should try and get out there for that. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been to Vegas either. So it would be good to do it. I right, give it a try. Uh, so how many picks overall do you think that the Seahawks turn their four picks into? I think seven or eight. Yeah. I think that's, that's right. And, and look, I, I, someone's, I've just seen it pop up on the blog in the last few moments. Someone has asked, you know, why do they have to trade down from 21? Why don't they just trade down from round three? <clears throat> and, and turn that pick into more picks and actually spend a high draft pick. I just don't think it's realistic. If you trade down from round three, what are you going to get? You know, you're going to get a six round, seven round pick at best. It's very hard to turn a third round pick into, you know, three or four extra picks sure. from 21. I think you've got to try and I think initially move down a little bit in, in round one, see if you can do a deal like last year, the Seahawks moved down from, I think it was like 18 to, um, what was it? 27 and got a third round pick out of it. So if you can move down another nine spots, maybe get down to number 30, which, funnily enough, is where the Packers, I think, are picking again. Um, and there's obviously a connection there with John Schneider. They've, they've done deals in the past. They did one last year. Is there another trade there, which means the Packers give the Seahawks a third-round pick? Maybe so. And then do you consider trading down again, maybe to get an extra fourth or a fifth by moving down a few extra spots after that? I think that's the kind of the, the direction that I would go. If you can get an extra third and a fourth out of this, that, you're up to six picks. And then with two thirds and a fourth, maybe you trade down again to get an extra sixth or seventh. And then, you know, you're getting up towards seven or eight picks then. So I think that's probably what they're going to do. But I would imagine that the Seahawks are probably not going to pick until either the late first round, maybe in the 30s, maybe even trade down as far as like number 40 or something before they make their first selection. They've got to do it. You know, they have to. They can't 
pick four times in this draft. They need depth. They have a lot of needs. They need competition across the board. They've got to try and find a way to get seven or eight picks. Well, Rob, really want to thank you for coming on the show. Want folks to check you out at SeahawksDraftBlog.com. I'm sure there's going to be a flurry of articles coming after the combine. During the combine, you're going to be breaking it down and all the way up until draft time in April. Yeah, if if people want to somewhere to to sort of find us a home for the combine, we're going to be doing a live blog every single day as it's going on. So I'll be reacting to everything as it happens. And then at the end of every day, we do like a review piece. So we will sort of do the live blog on the workouts, a review piece on the positions that are performed. At the end of the combine, we do a great big, huge review uh, about what we've learned. And then after that, we're sort of breaking down the different players that the Seahawks may well have interest in about what we know from their draft trends and stuff like that. So really busy time for the blog. It is the busiest time. It's, a, it's actually busier during the combine week. And it is actually during the, the week of the NFL draft on the blog. So it's a good community, good group there. If you want to log on, join the Combine, uh, join in the discussion and, um, and absorb everything about the Combine from a Seahawks perspective, then I'd, I'd certainly recommend checking out the blog. SeahawksDraftBlog.com, at Rob Staten on Twitter. Rob, thanks again for coming on the show. 